Charles Manson is one of the most talked about morbid icons of the last 100 years. Although he never killed anybody, he is often grouped in with the most infamous serial killers of the 60s and 70s, and for good reason. The cult that he created, known ominously as The Family, tormented much of California in the late 60s. Through their insane beliefs, unconventional lifestyle, and misguided leadership, the Manson family were responsible for at least nine different murders and dozens of other crimes. However, it all could have been avoided. In an alternative timeline, Charles Manson was destined for a different kind of legacy. A well-known fact is that Manson was a singer and songwriter during his time in California. However, this is rarely discussed, as it's very often overshadowed by his other insane activities. But this doesn't mean that Manson's career was boring by any means. People often underestimate how truly close he was to making it in the world of music, which is understandable given the context, but when you separate the art from the artist and you look at Manson's musical endeavors from an objective standpoint, he had a conventional talent and he was very close to making it on a number of occasions. We could have looked at this man very differently if only a few small things happened in his life. And it's for that reason that we are going to be having a look at Charles Manson's strange and bizarre music career and dissect who he was, what he did in the world of music, and what he could have achieved. Charles Manson was originally called No Name Maddox when he was born on the 13th of November, 1934. His 16 year old mother, Kathleen, would eventually have this change to Charles Maddox a few weeks later. Charles had a number of different paternal figures throughout his life that would influence his behavior and mind state. His biological father was a local con artist known as Colonel Scott Henderson, who Charles most likely never met because when he was informed that Kathleen was pregnant, he claimed that he needed to leave on army business, but he never returned. It was later revealed that Colonel was just a name and not actually a profession. When Kathleen realized this, she moved on and married William Eugene Manson in August of 1934, a few months before Charles was born. This relationship wouldn't work because Kathleen was a heavy drinker who would often binge with her brother Luther. Eventually, in 1937, William had enough and he filed for divorce. Charles would obviously keep his last name, but not much else is really known about this relationship, except for how rocky and brief it was, and it's hard to tell what kind of impact William might have had on Charles, but one thing is for sure, Kathleen was alone again, and this time, it would mostly remain that way until Kathleen and her brother Luther were eventually arrested in August of 1939 for armed robbery. They were sentenced to 5 and 10 years respectively, and Charles was now a 4 year old who had no connection to his biological father, no paternal figure whatsoever, and an alcoholic mother who is now in prison. This definitely had a pretty severe psychological toll on Charles, and we would see the effects of this pretty quickly given how mischievous and antisocial he was in his early years. Charles would move in with his aunt and uncle, Bill and Glenna Thomas, in the small town of McMechan, West Virginia and there, he would cause all sorts of trouble, including an actual attempt on his cousin Joanne's life that he would later claim to be self-defense, one of the many lies told by Charles at an early age. His mother was eventually released on parole in 1942, and Charles moved back in with her. She would continue to drink and commit a myriad of crimes that would land her in hot water, and it was clear that this would rub off on a young Charles Manson as he began to commit his own series of crimes from a very early age. These included petty theft, violent acts, and most notably, truancy. Manson wouldn't just skip school, he would also run away from home countless times. He would sleep under bridges, in the woods, and generally he would do anything to escape his troubled home life or his strict Catholic school that he attended. He would be sent to a number of strict juvenile facilities and reform schools. It was a vicious cycle, where Manson would be sent to a strict school, get abused or tormented, attempt to flee, commit more crimes, and then be sent to another school that was arguably stricter. This cycle would continue for a few years until he was transferred to a prison in October of 1951, thus concluding most of his teenage years with an abrupt and upsetting ending. All of this is pretty well known information and has been for decades, but some of it is actually relatively new and comes from a book written in 2013 called Manson, The Life and Times of Charles Manson by Jeff Gwynn. 
Gwyn interviewed a number of people who provided new insights into Manson's upbringing, including his cousin Joanne, and some childhood friends who knew him. Unfortunately, a lot of these interviews and insights neglect his musical background, and it's difficult to tell if there even was one. We do know when he learned to play the guitar, a story that we will soon get into, and we know that the Beatles were arguably his biggest musical influence, but we don't know who influenced him before this. It's entirely possible that Manson was simply a late bloomer when it came to music, and that he found his love for it later in life. Which is strange, but given his insane upbringing, it's really not that far-fetched. Regardless, Manson would find music one way or another. He was at a strange point in his life, a young man with a troubled childhood who was about to spend the next decade in and out of prison. Strangely, prison is where he would truly begin to hone his musical abilities. Madsen left the prison he was in after his auntie convinced authorities to let him live with her. The idea was that Charles would live there and that he would find work. This idea was short-lived because in February of 1952, Madsen was supposed to attend a parole meeting, but a month before that happened, he sexually assaulted a young boy at knife point and subsequently was sent to a federal reformatory in Virginia. There, he continued to commit more crimes, and because of this, he was transferred to a maximum security reformatory in Ohio. He was surprisingly released on good behavior in the summer of 1954, and six months later, he married a young woman named Rosalie Willis, who he had a child with in 1956. Manson would not be there for the birth of his son, however, because a few months prior, Rosalie and Charles stole a car and drove from Ohio to Los Angeles. After failing to show up for another parole meeting, for another car theft, Manson was sentenced to three years at Terminal Island, California. Now, that is a lot of bouncing around. Charles was being sent from prison to prison, state to state, and he was continuing to engage in criminal activities over and over again. There was no end in sight to all of these wild crimes, but there was one very important thing that happened amongst all this madness. Charles Manson was now in California. Not only that, but his mother, his wife, and his son were also living together in Los Angeles, and Manson now had a reason to stay. Rosalie would later move in with another man, and Manson would respond to this by trying to escape prison. He failed and was given five years probation, and in 1958, Rosalie divorced Charles. The madness continued. 1959, he was given a 10-year suspended sentence for attempting to forge a check. At the end of that year, he married Leona Candy Stevens, who actually helped him get that suspended sentence by making a plea to the parole board. Stevens was completely infatuated with Madsen, so much so that a year later in 1960, Madsen took her and another woman to New Mexico, where he essentially became a pimp and attempted to sell these women on the streets. This wasn't a very viable source of income, and after Madsen was questioned about this by police, he attempted to disappear, suspecting that the investigation was ongoing, which it was. He was arrested again, and this time he was forced to serve the 10-year suspended sentence. Now, I previously mentioned that Madsen honed his musical abilities in prison, and we just talked about an entire decade of crime-filled insanity without mentioning music once. And that's because there simply was no music. Madsen hadn't really shown any musical interest in this time. At least if he did, there's not much documentation about it, and there definitely isn't music to show for it. But this 10-year sentence was different, and Madsen would finally pick up a guitar, and suffice to say, he had one of the strangest teachers you can possibly imagine. In July of 1961, Manson was transferred from Los Angeles County Jail to the United States Penitentiary in Washington. There, he met an unlikely ally that would prove to be instrumental to Manson's musical endeavors. This man was Alvin Creepy Carpus. Born in 1907, Alvin Creepy Carpus was a Depression-era gangster who, in the 1930s, led a small but incredibly dangerous gang known as the Barker Carpus Gang a group that he co-founded with Fred Barker. This group had a network of around 25 people, and throughout the early 1930s, the gang were involved in countless crimes, like kidnapping, burglary, and murder. And the FBI were incredibly determined to put a stop to this gang. So much so that Carpus had become public enemy number one. 
He is one of only four criminals in American history to be given this label, and he is the only one who was captured alive when he was personally arrested by J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI. He was sentenced to life in prison, and he was sent to Alcatraz, where he spent 26 years there, making his sentence the longest in history of that notorious prison. After Alcatraz, Carpus was sent to McNeil Island Penitentiary in April of 1962, and this is where he met a strange young man named Charles Manson. Carpus took pity on Charles after hearing about his troubled past and decided to teach him the guitar. He wrote about this in his autobiography in 1980. This kid approaches me to request music lessons. He wants to learn guitar and become a music star. Little Charlie is so lazy and shiftless, I doubt he'll put in the time required to learn. The youngster had been in institutions all of his life. First orphanages, then reformatories, and finally federal prison. His mother, a prostitute, was never around to look after him. I decide it's time someone did something for him. And to my surprise, he learns quickly. He has a pleasant voice and a pleasing personality, although he's unusually meek and mild for a convict. He never has a harsh word to say and is never involved in even an argument. It's honestly baffling that Manson was taught how to play the guitar by a man who was considered to be one of the most dangerous criminals in American history, especially considering what Manson himself would become. But regardless of who taught him how to play, the result was the same. Charles Manson had picked up a guitar late in life, but luckily for him, he was a quick learner and a somewhat talented vocalist, and this meant that he now had the tools to create his own music. But he also had the charisma and confidence, he told Carpus that he was going to be bigger than the Beatles, which may come across as a bit delusional, but for someone who was in his dire position, it actually seemed like he had a bit of hope, and that maybe he would pursue something bigger and better than a life of crime. Of course, we know that this did not happen. He was eventually sent back to Terminal Island in 1966, and during his sentence, Leona Stevens divorced Charles, and it's possible that he was starting to feel institutionalized after having spent over half his life in prison at only 32 years of age. He actually requested to stay in prison, but this request was denied, and in 1967, Matson was released. He actually managed to stay out of prison for around two years this time, but that isn't because he was an innocent man. In fact, the crimes he would commit in these two years were the worst things he ever did, and he created a group that he used as an instrument for those crimes, a group known as the Manson Family. The story of the Manson family's conception is a tale that has been told many times, and while it does play a factor into Charles Manson's music, it is not the main force behind it. So for that reason, we'll keep this brief. Soon after his relief from prison, Manson moved to San Francisco and moved in with a 23-year-old woman named Mary Brunner. In the early days of their relationship, Manson would try and convince Brunner that it would be a good idea to have multiple different women live there in the apartment with them. An idea that Brunner did not like at first, but eventually, through Manson's manipulative nature, he managed to convince her to do this, and soon enough, the pair were living in a reasonably small apartment with 18 other women. This group would begin to revere Charles and follow his every word. They were the makings of his so-called family, and Manson was able to utilize a social phenomenon known as the Summer of Love to his advantage. The Summer of Love was a period of time where around 100,000 people began living in a small district in San Francisco. This area became one of the primary homes to the hippie subculture that would take the nation by storm in the 1960s. Manson used this as a tool to establish himself as a guru in the area, and a small number of enthusiastic followers would hang on his every word. Eventually, Manson and these newfound followers would leave San Francisco and drift around areas like Washington State, Mexico, and the American Southwest. In this time, Manson had a son with Mary Brunner in April of 1968, and a few months later, the group were were back in Los Angeles, where they would finally find a somewhat stable home, being rented out by none other than Dennis Wilson, the drummer of one of the most successful bands of all time, the Beach Boys. Wilson had been driving through Malibu in the spring of 1968 when he picked up two female hitchhikers. He brought them back to his home in Sunset Boulevard in the western part of Los Angeles, and later, he left for a recording session. When he came back, he was greeted by a strange man in his driveway. This man, of course, being Charles Manson. Wilson was confused, but when he stepped into his house, he saw around a dozen people, mostly young women. Wilson was intrigued by this, and he was fascinated by Manson, and he allowed them to stay. 
Manson had yet again used his charismatic and manipulative nature to get what he wanted, except this time, he had done something that most would deem to be impossible. He had gone from aimlessly wandering around the southwest of America with his impressionable followers to actually living with one of the most successful artists in Hollywood. In the 1960s, the Beach Boys were on top. They had released nine top 10 albums and sold millions of records. By 1968, when Wilson met Manson, their success had dwindled a bit, but they were still a household name and a force to be reckoned with. Manson's unlikely friendship with Wilson could have led him to be given the same treatment, but of course we know he did become a household name, but for an entirely different reason. Still, it's fascinating to look back and see how truly close he was to stardom. Charles Manson and Dennis Wilson quickly became friends. Charles was a huge fan of the Beach Boys and thus was in awe of Dennis and his accomplishments, likely wanting the same thing. Dennis liked Manson's way of life. In an interview with Rave Magazine, he called Manson the wizard because of his strange and charismatic energy. They would drink together, take drugs, and talk for hours while Manson's followers essentially acted as their servants. Naturally, the two began to play music together and they even formed a sort of collaboration. They wrote music together on a consistent basis. Some of these songs would even be recorded, and it seemed as if Manson had found his way into the collaboration process, and was on his way to contributing to the Beach Boys as a whole. Wilson actually spoke about this in an interview that was given in December of 1968 for Record Mirror. The article was written by David Griffiths, and it was appropriately titled, I Live With 17 Girls. Interestingly, this is before any of the crimes happened, and Dennis still brought Manson's name up independently. When speaking about Charles, he said, His mother was a hooker, his father was a gangster. He drifted into crime, but when I met him, I found he had great musical ideas. We're writing together now. He's dumb in some ways, but I accept his approach and have learned from him. This was proof that Manson was very much so involved in the creative process and that it wasn't just a novelty idea that was exaggerated after the murders. It was right there, in writing. After reading this interview, I was interested to learn more about this unconventional approach that Dennis Wilson talked about. After all, Manson had a relatively limited skill set and it was difficult to imagine him keeping up with Wilson from a conventional standpoint. But that's probably what made the collaboration work. Manson was essentially a wild card completely ignorant to the ins and outs of the recording industry, and therefore, he was able to add a fresh and unique perspective to the creative process. Interestingly, I did not find out much about Manson's process through an interview with Wilson, but instead through another massive star who also had an interaction with Manson. Neil Young would visit Dennis Wilson's house from time to time when the family were living there. In this time, he had a couple of interesting run-ins with Charles. When talking about one of these run-ins, Young states, after a while, a guy showed up, picked up my guitar, and started playing a lot of songs on it. His name was Charlie. He was a friend of the girls and now of Dennis. His songs were the off-the-cuff things he made up as he went along, and they were never the same twice in a row. Kind of like Dylan, but different because it was hard to glimpse a true message in them. But the songs were fascinating. He was quite good. This isn't the only time Manson's style was described as off-the-cuff or unconventional, and at times, it was probably a breath of fresh air. It seemed as if Manson was impressing everybody he was meeting. Young was so impressed, in fact, that he tried to get him a record deal, which ultimately failed. He also gave him a motorcycle, which is a fact that he would nonchalantly bring up in future interviews, but unfortunately, he wouldn't elaborate much on it. Still, it's a testament to Manson's musical abilities, and it was time to try and get those abilities out into the world. He would record a number of songs at Brian Wilson's home studio, which would never ultimately be released, but later, he would write a song that he called Cease to Exist, which the Beach Boys would actually record and release under a new title called Never Learn Not to Love. Manson was not credited for this. Instead, he was given money and, strangely enough, another motorcycle. However, this wasn't enough. Manson's ultimate goal was a record deal of his own. He wanted to achieve the same success as Dennis Wilson and Neil Young, and he was not a patient man. While Wilson did introduce Manson to quite a few promoters and producers, these meetings didn't lead anywhere. Manson particularly wanted to impress Terry Melcher, a friend of Wilson and also a prominent producer for Columbia Records. In Manson's mind, he had done enough and wanted the proper reward for his work. 
But understandably, Melcher was interested but wary about working with Charles because of his brash nature. This brash nature is also what ended his relationship with Dennis Wilson. There was a lot of conflicting reports and stories about how this relationship truly ended, but there are a number of key moments. One of these moments is when Manson pulled a knife on a studio engineer while they were recording. Another is that after Wilson told Manson about the song he had written being used on the latest Beach Boys album and that they had made some changes to the song, Charles had shown Dennis a bullet and told him to think of his kids and how nice it is that they're safe, which allegedly prompted Dennis to beat him up. A lot of these stories come from secondhand accounts, so it's difficult to tell fact from fiction, but either way the result was the same. Dennis distanced himself from Charles and the family moved out of the house and into Spawn Ranch, a disused movie ranch owned by George Spawn. Charles convinced him to let his cult move in there rent free in exchange for free labor and let's just say other favors. Still, after all of this, Charles wasn't giving up on his dream, and surprisingly, Terry Welcher still had some interest in working with him, so much so that he gave Charles an audition, and not much is really known about what happened at this audition, but in an article by the New York Times in 1970, they quote a testimony from Welcher where he states that he wasn't impressed enough to want to make a record, and considered Manson to be average. Apparently, even after the audition, Welcher was still interested in making a movie about Manson and his family. But while he was at Spawn Ranch, Welcher saw Charles get into a fight with a drunken stuntman and subsequently stopped filming. Sounds kind of familiar. Anyways, Welcher was essentially done with Manson, and so was Dennis Wilson. It appeared as if the dream was dead. After the praise, the promise, and the potential, Manson had essentially failed. Maybe he could have changed his ways and made more contacts, climbed up the ladder he so desperately wanted to climb, and get that record deal he had dreamed of for years. But we all know how this story ends. This was not a tale of redemption. This was a tale of pure carnage, and quite possibly, revenge. When Terry Melcher still had some interest in working with Manson, he met up with him at his house. The address was 150 Celio Drive, and this would be the home to the most brutal crime the Manson family ever committed. It goes without saying, but the Manson family were not some happy-go-lucky group of hippies. They were Manson's sworn supporters, and they revered him like a god. Anything he said, they did, and this was ultimately their downfall. Manson told his followers to go to this address and to kill anybody who was in there. Four of his followers, Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, Linda Kasabian, and Patricia Krenwinkel, went to this address and killed a man named Stephen Parent, who was leaving the house. They then entered the premises and proceeded to kill everybody inside. The victims were Jay Sebring, Wojek Frakowski, Abigail Folger, and actress Sharon Tate, who was eight months pregnant at the time. Terry Welcher was not there. In fact, he had moved out months prior, and while many people speculated that killing Welcher was the primary goal of this attack, this was probably not true. Both Tex Watson and Mark Lindsay, who was Terry's former roommate, stated that Manson knew Welcher was no longer living there, and that this was simply a familiar address that Manson could send his family to. But this was also most likely supposed to be a warning to Terry Melcher. One of the killers, Susan Watkins, stated that the act was done to instill fear into Terry Melcher because Terry had given us his word on a few things and never came through with them. It is quite possible that Manson had an ulterior motive. Maybe he wanted to scare Melcher so badly that he would succumb to the fear and give Charles a recording contract. Maybe Manson still had a small bit of hope in him that things would work out and that he would make it, regardless of how unconventional his road to success was. But this simply didn't happen, and the Manson family even continued their killing spree after the Tate murders. Apparently, Manson was disgruntled that the four murderers had panicked so much when murdering their victims, so a day later, he took those four murderers and two other family members on a drive so that he could show them how to do it. It was on this night that the family brutally killed Lino and Rosemary LaBianca, meaning that they had now killed seven people and an unborn baby in the space of around 24 hours. Surprisingly, the Manson family would not be apprehended for months. In fact, there was a time where it seemed as if they were going to get away with it. At the end of August, Three weeks after these murders were committed, the LAPD released a report stating that all of their leads had gone nowhere. 
They also ruled out any connection between the Tate and LaBianca homicides, and they even set up separate teams to work on these cases. If the Manson family simply laid low for a few months or even left California, then it's entirely possible that they would have gotten away with these crimes, at least for a few years. But they continued to operate out of Spawn Ranch and also continued to commit crimes such as car theft, assault, and yet another killing. This time, Donald Shea was the victim, the previously mentioned stuntman who Manson had gotten to a fight with. He was living on the ranch with the family, as he worked as a ranch hand for George Spahn at the time. They lived peacefully enough together for a few weeks, but eventually, tensions began to rise, and Shea was killed on the 26th of August, 1969, when Manson believed that he had informed the police of the Tate murders. This never happened, and it was probably just a made-up excuse as Manson had a lot of other reasons for disliking Shea, but he used this excuse to convince the family to kill him. It was clear that even though they were not being investigated for the Tate LaBianca murders at the time, Manson was still as paranoid as ever, and this paranoia would eventually lead to his downfall when investigators were able to piece together similar crimes in the area and link it all back to the Manson family. Although it took a while, the family were apprehended on the 1st of December 1969, and from there, fingerprints were discovered, weapons that were used for the murders were found, and confessions were made. When looking at all the evidence they eventually found, it's actually surprising that it took so long to prosecute the family, but they did not have this evidence to begin with, and the picture only became clear after the arrests. In the summer of 1971, the trial began, and the prosecution had a key witness that helped put the murderers and Manson behind bars. Linda Kasabian was there on the night of the murders, but simply kept watch and didn't actually kill anybody herself. In fact, she was having a lot of second thoughts about her role in the family, and for obvious reasons, she was terrified of Manson. So much so that she fled Spawn Ranch two days after the killings. She then turned herself in, and the family were arrested and agreed to testify against them. This testimony lasted 18 days, and it's often been cited as one of the main reasons that the Madsen family were convicted. On the 25th of January, 1971, each defendant was found guilty by a jury of their peers. And finally, it was over. The family, and Manson in particular, had become infamous in the eyes of the public over the last year. Charles had wanted to be a loved musician who was respected and revered, but instead, he was the nation's villain, the poster child for evil, and a man who would go down in history for all the wrong reasons. Strangely, we had to wait until Manson was locked up in order to hear some of his music. Phil Kaufman, a record producer who had met Manson in prison and briefly lived with him, raised around $3,000 and managed to release the album known as Lie, The Love and Terror Cult, a 14-track album that featured songs from Charles Manson that were recorded between 1967 and 1968. The album was raw and unconventional, but filled with interesting moments. It started out with Look at Your Game Girl, Manson's most popular song by far, a song that was more upbeat and more cohesive than most of the other songs on the album. It was surprisingly cheery, although some of the lyrics did have dark undertones. The album would have a few more moments that had a somewhat positive tone, like the songs Home is Where Your Heart Is and Arkansas. But songs like Mechanical Man, I'll Never Say Never to Always, and Big Iron Door were a lot more blatant when it came to how dark the lyrics were. This actually created an interesting contrast, and you didn't really know what you were going to get on the next song. But the album still flowed quite well, and overall, it was a decent psychedelic folk album. I don't think it would have achieved the success that it did without the major controversy behind it, as you could tell some of these songs, or at least the lyrics, were just made up on the spot, as he had a tendency to ramble on about a myriad of topics. Still, there was potential, and maybe if Madsen had been given the right tools to make more polished, coherent music, he might have made an album that could have propelled him to success. Madsen would go on to release some more music from prison, but these jail recordings were even less polished for obvious reasons, and they were never really discussed in the same way that his first album was. Most of these songs essentially faded into obscurity. Madsen and his cult would have a large cultural impact, especially in the world of music. But this had little to do with the recorded work and more to do with the Manson family's dark image. 
The English group Kasabian named themselves after Linda Kasabian, and they would achieve immense success in the UK. Shock rocker Marilyn Manson named himself after Marilyn Monroe and Charles Manson, and he would become one of the biggest industrial metal acts in the last few decades. And the electro-industrial group Spawn Ranch would name themselves after the home that the Manson family lived in. On top of this, Manson's name has been dropped in countless songs, his tracks have been covered by massive musical acts, and his image has been used or referenced on numerous occasions. So yes, Manson and the lore surrounding his life made a significant impact on the world of music, and quite possibly changed it forever in some way. But it had very little to do with his actual music, and more to do with the insane man that he was. Charles Manson died in prison on the 19th of November 2017 at the age of 83 from cardiac arrest and it's safe to say that he was not remembered for his music. Overall, the stories surrounding Charles Manson and his insane attempts to enter the musical world are almost hard to believe. He learned to play guitar from one of the most wanted men in American history. He wrote a song for the Beach Boys and lived with one of their members for several months. He drew comparisons to Bob Dylan by people like Neil Young and he met with record producers, label reps, and influential people in the industry, and after all of this, he still failed. He was able to manipulate his way into insane positions, but right when he should have capitalized on those opportunities, he would do something erratic or violent and squander any real chance he could have had. He was his own worst enemy, and his self-destructive tendencies led him down a path of carnage and bloodshed that almost seemed inevitable. A lot of people cite Manson's upbringing as a reason for his violent tendencies, but when it comes to Manson's musical endeavors, there was nobody to blame for his failure except for himself. It wasn't Dennis Wilson's fault, it wasn't Terry Welcher's fault, and it wasn't his mother's fault. The only person that stopped Charles Manson from making it in the world of music was Charles Manson. People look at you today, 20 years later, and they still have no idea what you're about. Tell me in a sentence who you are. Nobody. I'm nobody. I'm a tramp, a bum, a hobo. I'm a boxcar and a jug of wine and a straight razor if you get too close to me. The uh, president has partially collapsed, but that he is in good condition. Good condition. It was uh, stated earlier that his condition was stable. Now a hospital source, a doctor uh, at the uh, George Washington University Hospital has told us that the president is in good condition, though one lung has partially collapsed. Mrs. Reagan is there. She is said to be calm and collected. I'm going to give you the name of this uh, man that has been reported to us as the assailant, simply because everybody else is reporting his name. He is John W. Hinckley, Jr. Uh, that is the report we have. John W. Hinckley, Jr., 22 years old. It is understood that he is from Evergreen, Colorado. There have been plenty of entertainers and musicians who have committed serious crimes and still had a career after the fact. But today we're going to be talking about a man who committed such an intense and insane crime that you would think there is no possible way this man would be free today, let alone pursuing an actual music career and making more progress than he ever did before he committed said crime. But believe it or not, that is just a small footnote in this story because this is a tale that will bring us down some very interesting and disturbing roads. The man in question is John Hinckley Jr. and the crime in question is shooting and attempting to kill the United States President, Ronald Reagan, while he was still in office. That only scratches the surface when it comes to his crimes, as he was eventually charged with 33 different criminal offenses, but was actually not sentenced to prison and was instead institutionalized. He is currently a free man and is allowed to release his artistic works online. In fact, he's even amassed a small following and he intends to release an album, potentially sign with a record company, and essentially pursue a music career. Now, how could this possibly happen? How could a man shoot the current acting president of the United States, be charged with almost three dozen different crimes, and still be around today as a free man with a potential music career on the horizon? Well, those are some questions we're going to be answering as we take a look at one of the craziest stories we have ever covered on Morbid Musicians. 
This is the story of John Hinckley Jr. John Hinckley Jr. was born on the 29th of May, 1955, in Oklahoma. But by the time he was four, his family had moved to Dallas, Texas, where his father, John Hinckley Sr., operated an oil company that he had independently created. This company already made his family quite wealthy, but over the next decade and a half, this wealth would become even larger, and it was clear that Hinckley Jr. came from a family with a substantial fortune. He attended Highland Park High School in Texas and according to reports, he was a good student who actually had an interest in basketball and football. He was quite good at these sports and by all accounts, he had a normal experience as a teenager in high school. This changed in the last couple of years when, reportedly, he stopped playing these sports and stopped socializing as much, instead opting to stay in his room and listen to music. This is also when he took an interest in creating music. He started learning the guitar and he began to write songs in his bedroom that would never see the light of day, but they did inspire him to pursue a career in his later life. He did graduate high school and he attended Texas Tech University in 1974. There he was an off and on student who didn't take his studies too seriously and eventually he dropped out. Sometime between 1975 and 1976, Hinckley moved to Los Angeles to pursue a full-time career in songwriting. While he was there, he wrote to his parents about his travels and stated that they were not going well. He consistently asked for money and at the time, his father had become the president and senior chairman of the Vanderbilt Energy Corporation. Many different publications wrote articles at the time that valued this company in the millions, with them consistently turning in profits and having one successful year after another. It's very likely that Hinckley Sr. was now a much wealthier man and it's entirely possible that he was able to fund his son's time in Los Angeles for a while, but even then, Hinckley Jr.'s time in Los Angeles was short-lived and by September of 1976, he had moved back home with his parents, who were now living in Evergreen, Colorado. This may have seemed like a normal endeavor at the time. A young man with a dream moves to a big city to try and pursue it, but subsequently fails and moves back home. But it was actually much more convoluted than that. For one, the actual letters he wrote had some concerning footnotes. He wrote about a girlfriend that he had started dating called Lynn Ann, who turned out to be a complete fabrication and never actually existed. The main red flag, however, was very strange and it was one that would start a chain of insane events and believe it or not, it came from the release of a movie that he watched while he was in Los Angeles. For most people, this movie is a classic piece of cinema. For Hinckley Jr., this movie changed his entire life and the lives of many other people. The movie Taxi Driver was released in 1976. It was directed by Martin Scorsese and it starred Robert De Niro. Although it only had a relatively low budget of $1.9 million, it grossed almost $30 million and ended up becoming a critical and commercial success. The movie tells the story of Travis Bickle, a 26-year-old veteran who is now a taxi driver in New York City. He suffers from PTSD, chronic insomnia, depression, and fights many other mental battles that all eventually culminate in him fighting a group of gangsters in order to save a 12-year-old prostitute named Iris. There are a lot of other plot lines that are in this movie and I could talk about it for ages, but what's important to note is that the movie resonated with a lot of people when it came out. It was raw, it was gritty, it spoke about mental health, and it covered a lot of very real topics that other blockbuster movies avoided. John Hinckley Jr. was one of these starry-eyed viewers and he fell in love with this movie instantly, reportedly watching the movie 15 times in the cinema. However, while most audience members were falling in love with the cinematography, the performances, and the story, John was developing a very inappropriate infatuation for the 12-year-old actress Jodie Foster, who played the child prostitute in the movie. As I mentioned beforehand, Hinckley had left college at this point and he was 21 years of age when this movie was released, but still he obsessed over Jodie Foster for years. From 1977 to 1980, Hinckley's mental health drastically declined and his obsession with Jodie Foster grew at a rapid pace. He was taking multiple different antidepressants every day, but these were not working. 
He said, my nervous system is shot in a letter that he wrote to his sister, referencing the antidepressants. In 1979, he purchased his first gun and over the next couple of years, he added quite a few more to his collection. Finally, in 1980, when Jodie Foster started studying at Yale University, he actually moved to Connecticut to stalk her. He left her messages, he slipped her poems, and he even managed to get her on the phone a few times, but all of this was met with either confusion or anger. Hinckley realized that his advances were not working and decided that he had to do something much bigger to get her attention. He thought about multiple different crimes that he could commit in order to impress her and ultimately landed on the idea that he should try and kill the current acting president at the time, Jimmy Carter. He actually trailed Carter from state to state with a gun, but eventually after he made pretty much no progress with this plan, he got arrested for possessing a firearm in Tennessee. He went home with no money, a firearms charge, and he had essentially completely failed this mission. He was a broken man by his own doing, and at this point it seemed like Hinckley was really only dangerous to himself. I mean, he was clearly a disturbed man, but this strange tour of America was most likely an indicator that he was not going to do anything overly violent. At least that's what a psychiatric professional might have told you at the time, but boy were they wrong. This idea was still well and truly rooted in his brain, and by 1981, nothing had changed. He still wanted to do something that would capture Jodie Foster's attention, and at this stage, Ronald Reagan was now the president of America, and Hinckley had his eyes on him. The target was now in his crosshairs, and this time, Hinckley was going to pull the trigger. On the 28th of March, 1981, Hinckley Jr. arrived in Washington, D.C. and checked into a hotel. He noticed in the local newspaper that Ronald Reagan was going to be delivering an address at the Washington Hilton Hotel just two days later, and he decided that this was the time to strike. He was actually on his way to New Haven, Connecticut, where he was going to once again stalk Jodie Foster, but this opportunity fell onto his lap, and it was clear that he believed this was the only true way to get her attention. We know this because he wrote one final letter to Foster that ultimately wouldn't be sent directly to her, but it was read aloud in the court trial, so we know exactly what it says, and it was one of the most disturbing letters Hinckley ever wrote to Jodie Foster. It said the following, Dear Jody, there is a definite possibility that I will be killed in my attempt to get Reagan. It is for this very reason that I am writing you this letter now. As you well know by now, I love you very much. Over the past seven months, I've left you dozens of poems, letters, and love messages in the faint hope that you could develop an interest in me. I will admit to you that the reason I'm going ahead with this attempt now is because I just cannot wait any longer to impress you. I've got to do something now to make you understand, in no uncertain terms, that I am doing all of this for your sake. By sacrificing my freedom and possibly my life, I hope to change your mind about me. This letter is being written only an hour before I leave for the Hilton Hotel. Jody, I'm asking you to please look into your heart and at least give me the chance, with this historical deed, to gain your respect and love. It's clear from this letter that Hinckley had not only completely lost any sense of reality that he had, but also that he was actually stating that this act was only happening to impress Jodie Foster. In this letter, he also talks about being outside her dormitory, listening to her conversations, and many other creepy encounters that he had with the movie star. He was manic, and this letter had about every red flag you could possibly imagine. Unfortunately, nobody except for Hinckley would read this letter until after the event in question, because immediately after writing it, he went to the Hilton Hotel. The hotel in question was actually considered to be extremely safe, especially for political figures. After Reagan finished his address, he walked down a passage known as the President's Walk, which was created after Kennedy was assassinated. Although he normally wore a bulletproof vest, he was only going to be outside for a short period of time, and on this day, it was deemed unnecessary for him to wear one. Hinckley managed to sneak into a crowd of admirers without being searched or even suspected. At 2.27 p.m., Reagan left the hotel and began walking towards his limousine with the Secret Service and local police standing near him and trading close behind. He walked directly past Hinckley, who crouched on the ground, pulled out a blue steel revolver, and shot at Ronald Reagan and his team six times in less than two seconds. None of these shots directly hit the president, but almost every single shot had a significant impact. 
The first shot hit the White House press secretary James Brady in his head, shattering his brain cavity and knocking him to the ground. The second shot hit police officer Thomas Delahanty in the back of his neck, and he also fell to the ground. At this stage, Special Agent Jerry Parr had a split-second reaction to this shooting and grabbed Reagan. They started to run towards the limo. This is when the third shot came and just overshot the president, instead hitting a building behind them. It would have almost definitely made contact if it wasn't for Parr's quick reaction. Behind the two of them, another special agent, Tim McCarthy, was following them to ensure their safety and upon hearing the third shot, he turned around, spread out his arms and legs, and made sure that he was as wide as possible in order to block any potential shots. This shot did come and it actually hit McCarthy. The fifth shot hit the bulletproof window of the door that the president had just entered, and the sixth and final shot ricocheted off the limousine and actually did hit Ronald Reagan. The bullet grazed his rib and lodged inside his lung which subsequently collapsed. The bullet ended up being 25 millimeters away from his heart, making it extremely close to being a fatal shot. At this stage, Hinckley had been wrestled to the ground, his guns were dispossessed, and many people, including citizens, started to attack him. In fact, Agent McCarthy, the man who Hinckley had just shot, had to pull certain people away from the scene so that he could prosecute him safely. Hinckley was restrained and taken to jail in DC, while Ronald Reagan was taken to the nearest hospital. Although the bullet had ricocheted and not actually hit Reagan directly, it caused a great deal of damage and by the looks of things, it appeared that he was dying. In the limo, he was coughing up blood and when he got to the hospital, he could barely breathe anymore. He was 70 years of age at the time and losing a lot of blood. His odds for survival were very low, but because he was in great physical shape and the medical team involved did everything that they needed to do at a rapid pace, they were able to fix his blood pressure, remove the bullet from his body, and stabilize him within a few hours. In this time, he lost half of the blood volume in his body, but he managed to survive and by April 11th, just 12 days after he was shot, Reagan returned to the Oval Office. The police officer who had jumped in front of the bullet to protect Reagan, Tim McCarthy, was dis discharged before anybody else and was known nationwide as the hero who saved the president. He was given an award of valor the next year and became a member of the Secret Service in the late 80s. Thomas Delahanty, the other police officer at the scene, suffered permanent nerve damage to his arm and although he was considered a hero, he was forced to retire from being a police officer. Finally, James Brady, the White House press secretary, was the last man to leave the hospital. This is because he was hit directly in the head and his injury was by far the most severe. In fact, many different news outlets reported that Brady had been killed, but this was not true. He was stabilized and survived, but he was also partially paralyzed and was forced to use a wheelchair for the rest of his life. His speech was slurred, his memory was affected, and his neural functions greatly declined. All of this was the damage that one man inflicted in the space of two seconds. It was the most disgusting in America for weeks, and the question now was, what was going to happen to John Hinckley Jr.? Many people thought that he would get the death penalty, some people thought that he was going to get life in prison, but as you know, neither of those things happened. Instead, we were given one of the strangest court trials of the 80s that ultimately led to a baffling conclusion. John Hinckley Jr.'s trial began in 1982 in Washington, D.C. As I mentioned previously, Hinckley came from a very wealthy family and they were able to provide him with the best legal defense that money could buy. This came in the form of Vincent J. Fuller, an accomplished lawyer who actually defended the notorious gangster Jimmy Hoffa. He also defended the likes of Mike Tyson, Don King, and many other high-profile clients, and let's just say he had a knack for getting his clients some pretty decent deals given the circumstances that they were in. But this case was obviously different. Hinckley Jr. had literally shot the President of the United States and three other people, paralyzing the White House press secretary in the process. The only way Vincent J. Fuller could possibly help his client avoid prison time was by using the insanity defense. However, this defense had only been used in around 2% of felony cases, and 75% of those cases were completely unsuccessful. Obviously, given the circumstances, this wasn't likely to succeed. But the trial commenced regardless, 
and a grueling four-month process began where the prosecution and the defense both tried to define Hinckley's mental health, with the prosecution trying to define it as a personality disorder and the defense trying to define it as a serious crippling mental illness. In order to do this, they had to look into every aspect of Hinckley's life, including journal entries, phone calls, and letters that he had written. Hinckley actually stated that he would not cooperate unless Jodie Foster herself testified at the trial. Surprisingly, her lawyers agreed that she would in fact testify, probably hoping that this would help set the story straight and lead to John Hinckley being convicted. So, she took the stand but made no eye contact with Hinckley, she kept her answers short, and she stated that he called and wrote numerous times but that it meant nothing. And finally, when she was asked what her relationship was with Hinckley, she stated, I don't have a relationship with John Hinckley. Hinckley clearly wasn't very happy with this as he threw a ballpoint pen at her and shouted, I'll get you, Foster, before she left the room. In hindsight, all of this probably helped John's case as he was seemingly quite manic for most of the trial. When you combine that with the ramblings and the testimonies, you can start to understand why a jury of his peers found John Hinckley Jr. not guilty by reason of insanity on the 21st of June, 1982 not guilty. Regardless of the reasoning, I don't think anybody thought that the jury would be saying those words on the day of John Hinckley's sentencing. But they did, and Hinckley was sent to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. There, he had to undergo treatment for his disorders and mental conditions, and within weeks, they considered him to be unpredictably dangerous. Regardless of this, his time there was fairly tame, and he actually renewed his interest in music while he was being treated at the hospital. He also got therapy, played pool, wrote hundreds of letters, and seemingly did whatever he could to pass the time while he was being treated. The main thing he did was focus on his freedom. After only a few years in the institution, Hinckley applied for a court order that would allow him to visit home periodically. This was actually declined because when they searched his room, they found letters that were written to and from serial killer Ted Bundy. It was clear that Hinckley was still not in an okay place, but over the years, his antics calmed down and it appeared that therapy and medication was leading him down a successful path of rehabilitation which subsequently led to him obtaining a few of his freedoms back. By 1999, he was allowed supervised visits to his parents' house. In 2005, these visits were extended and were unsupervised. And in 2009, he was allowed to be at his mother's home for 120 days of the year, and it seemed as if his full freedom was only down the road. However, in 2014, James Brady died, and the death was quickly ruled a homicide. This meant that Hinckley was officially a murderer, but there was no charge for this because of the year and a day rule, which states that if the victim dies over 366 days after the incident, the perpetrator cannot be charged with the murder, even if it was the direct reason for the death. You would think that this death and the subsequent ruling would affect Hinckley's potential freedom, but honestly, it did very little, if anything at all, because around two years later in September of 2016, John Hinckley Jr. was released and allowed to live full-time at his mother's home in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. This came with a laundry list of restrictions, most of which were specific to his case, such as possessing photos of Jodie Foster, contacting anybody from the victim's family or the victims themselves, visiting any graves of past presidents, and a whole host of other general restrictions like consuming alcohol, watching violent TV, and possessing firearms. But if we've learned anything about this case so far, it's that Hinckley is willing to fight for as much freedom as humanly possible, and that is exactly what he did, leading to a very strange chain of events that introduced Introduced us to his music. In October 2020, a federal court ruled that Hinckley may showcase and market his artwork, writings, and music publicly under his own name. His way of doing this was very interesting. He created a YouTube channel, and in December of 2020, Hinckley started to share his work with us. His original song, Majesty of Love, was the first video that he created, and it's also his most popular, garnering around 200,000 views in the last nine months. On top of this, he does covers, and he's also stated that he actually intends to make an album in the not-so-distant future. 
His channel is currently doing quite well. Actually, when I started this script, he had around 17,000 subscribers, and now he has around 20. That might not seem like the most significant jump ever, but he shot Ronald Reagan, so the fact that he even has an active YouTube channel at all is pretty baffling. A few things have happened since he started his channel with regards to his case. That could actually have an effect on his potential music career. For one, his mother passed away at the age of 95, which may actually affect the conditions of his release as he was forced to live in his mother's residence when he was first let go. Now he is contesting those conditions. A hearing was set up for the 30th of August where his unconditional release would be considered. This hearing more than likely happened around a month ago and I can't find any information on it whatsoever, but do not be surprised if John Hinckley is released on an unconditional basis and be even less surprised if this has a dramatic effect on the popularity of his music. Although Hinckley's music isn't bad by any stretch of the imagination, it would be silly to insinuate that he would have the same amount of popularity if it wasn't for his insane life story. However, he cannot talk about that story in any kind of public forum, whether that be to the press, on a blog, in his music, or to any journalist that might be interested in speaking to him. But if these conditions are lifted and Hinckley can speak about his case freely in a public manner, then the promotion that this could potentially give to his music and to himself is astronomical. I only say this because it shows the potential that Hinckley actually has to make a successful album and a successful music career. I have no idea if this is something he even wants to do, but the window of opportunity is fast approaching and it would only make this story even crazier. Although this story was globally reported when it happened, and it's an incredibly well-documented case, I feel like it's kind of been swept under the rug in recent years. Maybe because nobody was immediately killed or there was simply too much for people to digest, but whatever the reason may be, I think overlooking this case is a mistake because this event had a ripple effect like no other. Firstly, the Brady Act was implemented in 1994, and this was a bill that mandated federal background checks on people in the US who purchase firearms. And it was backed by Reagan himself, who at this stage was consistently campaigning for more gun control. On top of this, the Insanity Defense Reform Act was put in place in 1984, and this was actually signed by Reagan himself. It was a bill that made obtaining a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity a lot more difficult to get. This, of course, was a direct response to the public outcry over John Hinckley's sentencing. Also, the whole incident in general made Reagan a lot more popular. Although he won the 1980 election pretty comfortably, winning by about 8 million votes, his next run was the second most lopsided election in American history. He won by almost 20 million votes and he also won every single state in the Electoral College except for one. Now the fact that he got shot is not the only reason he won so comfortably and he was almost definitely going to win regardless, but the shooting did boost his approval rating considerably and make certain people change their minds on Reagan. All of this came from that day. Those six shots were fired in less than two seconds and in those two seconds, everything changed. It is truly a bizarre our story. From the reasoning, to the act, to the consequences, to the fact that the perpetrator is a free man making music on YouTube right now, today. The world is truly a crazy place. Today, a federal judge approved the unconditional release of John Hinckley Jr. Remember, he's the man who shot and wounded President Ronald Reagan and three others in 1981. Hinckley was found not guilty by reason of insanity and then confined to a mental facility for decades. The judge said Hinckley could be freed from all restrictions. That's as soon as next June. In the world of music, Hoodie Ledbetter, otherwise known as Leadbelly, is a well-known icon whose innovative style changed the way that certain artists play the blues and folk music. By the time he died, he was known as the King of the 12-String Guitar, which was a nickname he actually gave to himself at the beginning, but by the time his career was over, everybody was calling him that. He not only left behind a vast discography of compelling music, but his life story is arguably more interesting than his musical endeavors. From prison breaks, to murder, to a treasure trove of compelling art, this man's life truly had it all, and that's what we're going to be having a look at today. This is the insane life of Leadbelly. It's hard to tell when Lead Belly was actually born because there is discrepancies between the recorded census and the information provided by people close to him. But the most popular answer is January 20th, 1888. 
Either way, it was the late 1800s, and his parents, Sally Brown and Wesley Ledbetter, raised him in mooring sport, Louisiana. According to the Blues Encyclopedia, Leadbelly had an okay upbringing, but still dropped out of school at 12 years old. At this point, his family was in Texas, and soon after this, he was living next to his parents in Bowie County with his wife, Aletha Henderson. At this stage, Hoodie had already been introduced to music through his uncle, Terrell, who at first gave him an accordion, but later was credited with also introducing him to the guitar and teaching him the basics. However, the renowned ability he would later achieve did not come from his uncle, but instead came from a sort of cocktail of musically defining moments. The timeline here is a little messy, and there are some holes in what really happened, but regardless of how patchy the story is, the result was the same. So to start off in his early career, Lead Belly often performed at a place called St. Paul's Bottoms, which was a notorious red light district in Louisiana that introduced Lead Belly to saloons, brothels, and dance halls, playing an array of different music that would help Lead Belly have an open mind when it came to his sound. Secondly, Lead Belly started playing with an artist known as Blind Lemon Jefferson in Texas, who helped him improve his skill set on the guitar. Jefferson was an intricate player who didn't follow the conventional norms of blues, and it's entirely possible that his unique style rubbed off on Lead Belly when they played together. Finally, and most importantly, at some point in the early 1900s, Lead Belly began to use a 12-string guitar instead of the traditional 6-string guitar. This allegedly came from Lead Belly witnessing a Mexican musician using the instrument, and since then, it became his forte. This would become a staple of Lead Belly's music. The area he played in, the teacher he had, and the 12-string guitar he used were all formative parts of Lead Belly's earlier musical endeavors, and it's clear that he was not only becoming a well-rounded, unique musician, but that he was ready to take it seriously. So much so that in his early 20s, he left his home and his family. He had at least two children at this stage and was still married to Aletha Henderson, but even with all of that, he only seemed to truly care about traveling around America with his music. In the early 1910s, he lined the railroad tracks, picked cotton, and played his music to whoever would listen around the southwest of America. This lifestyle seemed to have been working. He was described as a very hard worker, and his music was clearly getting better, so Lead Belly seemed to be heading in the right direction, but in the mid-1910s, something pretty bizarre happened that changed the course of Lead Belly's life. In 1915, Lead Belly was arrested for possessing a pistol and assault in Texas and was subsequently sent to work with the Harrison County chain gang for 30 days. This did not last long, however, because after only a couple of days with the chain gang, he escaped from custody, allegedly outrunning the officer's dogs in the process. After this, he stayed in Texas and used a fake name, Walter Boyd, which he used to find work in Bowie County. This pseudonym lasted for a few years, but in December of 1917, he found himself in some serious trouble when he shot and killed one of his relatives, Will Stafford, over a woman. It looked like Lead Belly would be spending the rest of his life in prison, or at the very least, he wouldn't be getting out for a few decades. However, he figured out a system that seemed to work in his favor. He would sing to the prisoners and the guards, and he also generally stayed under the radar and didn't violate any of the prison's rules. He did find himself in a pretty serious situation when another prisoner stabbed him in the neck. He almost killed the assailant in retaliation, but both he and the attacker survived. This attack left him with a nasty scar on his neck that he would cover up with the bandana. In later years, this actually became a staple of his aesthetic, and the incident in question added to his already dangerous image. But his image in prison was fairly clean, and he used this to his advantage when he asked for his freedom by writing a song to Pat Moore's Neff the governor of Texas at the time. Neff had strong principles and had actually stated that he had no intention to issue any pardons when he came into power, but Lead Belly seemed to be the exception. Between the song, his good behavior, and the fact that he had served seven years of his sentence, which was the minimum amount at the time, 
Governor Neff decided to issue the pardon in 1925, and Leadbelly was a free man. This freedom lasted around five years, and in this time, Leadbelly essentially continued what he was already doing before, picking up odd jobs that he could get and playing his music in his free time. However, if you haven't figured it out by now, Leadbelly had a pretty abrasive personality and quite the temper. He was also an alcoholic, and this would lead him down a dangerous road that unfortunately ended up with him being back in prison in 1930. This time, it was for attempted murder after he got into another fight. His temper and alcoholism had yet again led him to prison, and it wasn't looking like Leadbelly was headed down a road that would lead anywhere, but fortunately for him, he met somebody while he was in prison that would change his life forever. The early 1930s saw the peak of the Great Depression in the United States. Unemployment was ridiculously high, and around 20% of all Americans were unemployed. People were losing their jobs left, right, and center, and one man who lost almost everything was John Lomax. Not only did he lose his job at the bank that he worked at, but his wife also passed away around the same time. Lomax went into a deep depression but was pulled out of it by his oldest son, Alan Lomax, who recommended that they tour America and search for folk songs, something that John Lomax used to do as a job. Their goal was to make an anthology of music that they found, and they would go from town to town searching for underground artists, specifically African American folk musicians who wouldn't normally be given a platform. You can probably guess where this story is going. One day while they were visiting a prison in Louisiana, they came across Leadbelly and were instantly impressed. Later, they returned to the prison with some recording equipment and recorded hundreds of his songs. This was most likely the first time he had ever been recorded somewhat properly, which was baffling considering how talented he was and the fact that he was now in his 40s. Lomax was so impressed by him that he took a petition and a Leadbelly recording to the Louisiana governor, Oscar K. Allen, requesting that Leadbelly be released. Soon after this request was made, Leadbelly actually was released but the governor and the prison claimed that this was simply because of good behavior and because of budget cuts. However, Leadbelly hadn't even served his minimum sentence yet, and both him and Lomax believed that the recording they had sent the governor had worked and they were covering their tracks because this was the second time that Leadbelly had successfully sung his way out of jail. Regardless of the reason, Leadbelly was yet again a free man. He was out of prison, but everything was far from perfect. It was the middle of the Great Depression and he was just released from prison. It's safe to say that nobody was going to hire Leadbelly, and because of this, he asked John Lomax for some kind of job. Lomax took him on as his driver, and for three months, they traveled around the states together searching for folk music. This helped Leadbelly learn even more about the world of music, and being with somebody as knowledgeable as John Lomax was definitely beneficial to Leadbelly's music. In December of 1934, Leadbelly participated in a group sing at a college where Lomax was doing a lecture. There were members of the press that wrote sensationalist articles about the performing convict and the man who sung his way out of prison. It wasn't the most flattering depiction of Leadbelly, but it led to quite a bit of recognition, and probably because of this surge of interest, Lomax agreed to become Leadbelly's manager. Through a friend, he managed to get Leadbelly signed to ARC Records, and in January of 1934, they recorded a handful of songs with him that would be the first Leadbelly recordings ever released. They also did a short promotional tour that included interviews, write-ups, and articles about Leadbelly. But unfortunately, this didn't lead to any significant sales. This may have been because the label didn't release any of his folk songs, instead opting to only release the blues songs that he recorded even though the former would prove to become much more popular in the future. Another reason may have been the way they marketed him. Many articles focused on his crimes, his race, and pretty much anything controversial that they could get their hands on except for his actual music. Maybe if they allowed him to release the music he was better at making, or if they simply marketed him as a musician, his earlier work could have been more popular. But alas, this didn't happen. This meant that he made very little money from his music, but he did make some money from his touring. However, this also came to an abrupt end in March of 1935, when John Lomax decided that he could not work with Leadbelly anymore. The reason was yet again his alcoholism. He decided to give Leadbelly and his new wife, Martha Promise, some money to get home, but he said that he would not pay the full amount he was owed for the shows because Leadbelly would waste it all on alcohol. Instead, he stated that he would pay the money in installments. 
Leadbelly was not happy about this at all, and he successfully sued Lomax for the amount that he was owed. This lawsuit was also the death of their partnership. It was alleged that things got very tense between the pair, and it was clear that they weren't going to work together ever again. Leadbelly actually did reach out one final time, suggesting that they mend their differences, but this didn't lead anywhere. This was unfortunate because although there was some controversies about the way Lomax managed Leadbelly, they made a lot of progress with promotion, shows, and the actual recordings. They may have got there by some unconventional means, but Leadbelly was now more known than ever before, which set him up to become the musician that he's remembered as. It may have been a short period of time, but this chapter is incredibly important in the story of Leadbelly, and his partnership with John Lomax changed everything. In 1939, Leadbelly went to prison for a final time. This is when the previously mentioned Alan Lomax, John's son, decided to help Leadbelly with his legal fees and later his music career. Alan had a show on CBS with director Nicholas Ray called Back Where I Come From. Leadbelly became a regular on this show, which helped propel his name further. New York's folk scene was also on the rise in the early 1940s, and Leadbelly, along with a few others, were at the forefront of this. All of this led him to being signed with Capitol Records in 1944. He moved to California and started to record, and it's safe to say that production-wise, some of the best Leadbelly records ever recorded were done in this time frame. From 1944 to 1948, he recorded songs like Irene, Backwater Blues, and Where Did You Sleep Last Night. Some of his singles were compiled to make the album Midnight Special, which is not only now considered to be an iconic folk album, but it's also very important because it's the last Lead Belly album that was released while he was still alive, because soon after this, he died. So in theory, 1949 was Lead Belly's most successful year. He had his own radio show called Folk Songs of America, which is pretty self-explanatory, and he was continuing to do shows across America. However, his music had left the States and he actually had a fan base in Europe. He is widely considered to be the first American blues artist to establish a presence in Europe, and he took advantage of this by going on a European tour that started in France. Unfortunately, this tour was cut short when he fell ill and had to return home. Shortly after, he was diagnosed with ALS and he was dying. However, before he died, he performed his final ever show at the University of Texas in Austin in honor of John Lomax, who died a year prior. This was a very fitting way to bring things full circle and to say goodbye to the world of music. On the 6th of December 1949, Hoodie Ledbetter passed away, and it's safe to say that in his 61 years in this world, Leadbelly changed music forever. There was only 25 days left of the 40s when Leadbelly died, meaning he pretty much lived through all of it. And it's safe to say that the 40s was Leadbelly's most successful decade by far, and it's actually a pretty amazing contrast when you look at the way his life went previously. In the 20s, he was serving a life sentence for literally killing one of his family members. In the 30s, he was in prison again and ended up suing his friend and mentor, and in the 40s, he was a married man with his own radio show, a music career that literally took him to Europe, and he was one of the most recognizable faces of the American folk scene. I'm not saying everything was perfect, of course there was a little war that happened in the 40s that I'm sure was stressful for him and everybody around him, but in comparison to his earlier life, Lead Belly had hit his stride and cemented his legacy. His music would live on through the artist he influenced. His impact on folk and blues music was undeniable, but he transcended even that. George Harrison stated, If there was no Lead Belly, there would be no Lonnie Donegan. If there was no Lonnie Donegan, there'd be no Beatles. Therefore, no Lead Belly, no Beatles. As well as this, Bob Dylan cited him as his main influence, and most famously, Lead Belly was Kurt Cobain's favorite artist which led to Nirvana covering his rendition of Where Did You Sleep Last Night on MTV Unplugged. This cover was immensely popular, and it introduced a younger audience to the works of Lead Belly. I could talk about his influence in the world of music for hours, but this video is mostly just to serve as a jumping off point. If you want to find out more about the impact that this man made, just go looking for it, and I guarantee that you will find it everywhere. form of music, they say, has disturbing satanic overtones. It's called black metal music and encourages devil worship and the desecration of churches. 
Black metal has become one of the most talked about, controversial subgenres over the last few decades. Its history is so long, rich, and confusing that even trying to dissect the genre as a whole is a task that many music journalists have failed at. But there is one man that has so many ties to the genre and such an influence on the music that merely talking about him and the band he was a part of is a crash course into the history of black metal itself. This man was A. Stein Orset, otherwise known as Euronymous. He was the co-founder of the Norwegian band known as Mayhem, a notorious group that had an intense influence on the scene as a whole, and he perfectly encapsulated the absolute insanity that some of these black metal icons took part in. His extreme antics, nihilistic nature, and abrasive persona made him stand out like a sore thumb in a genre that was already pretty intense to begin with. All of these elements would eventually combine to a shocking conclusion in 1993 when Euronymous was killed by his own bandmate. But we have about a thousand other crazy things to talk about before we get to that point. So strap in and join me as we have a look at the insane life of one of black metal's biggest icons. On the 22nd of March 1968, A. Stein Orseth was born in Igersund, Norway, a small town in the south that had actually been broken up and divided three years prior, meaning that the population of the town he grew up in was only around 3,700 people. Very little is known about his childhood, as is the case with many black metal musicians, but what is known is that Arseth rebelled from the conventional norms of his small town from an early age, and he was inspired by other metal bands, like many of his contemporaries. One of these bands was an English group known as Venom, based in Newcastle. Venom was also trying to escape from the conventional norms that they felt trapped in, but instead of breaking away from society, they were actually trying to break away from metal itself. They wanted to take everything up a notch, from their sound to their imagery, and that's exactly what they did on their sophomore album released in 1982, which was actually called Black Metal. It was an 11-track album that was filled with satanic imagery, shocking lyrics, and louder, more extreme production that would prove to be hugely influential to trash metal, extreme metal, and of course, black metal, even lending the name to the genre. A 22-year-old Euronymous, desperate to rebel and do something similar, would be hugely influenced by this album and would cite it as one of his main inspirations for starting his own band with some friends in 1984. This band was called Mayhem, which was derived from a Venom song titled Mayhem with Mercy. And it was started by drummer Shekel Monheim, who simply called himself by his second name, bassist Jorn Stubberud, otherwise known as Necro Butcher, and Aistine, who played the guitar, and originally called himself Destructor, but later changed his name to Euronymous. These three would have a rocky few years at the beginning, with a number of different vocalists that would make some of their earlier releases inconsistent but interesting numbers. The less. They would attract a small but loyal underground following and perform at some local venues, but the most important thing they did was build the foundation for what Mayhem were to become. It was only a matter of time before everybody in Norway was talking about Mayhem and black metal in general, although this wasn't necessarily a good thing. In the beginning, Mayhem performed covers of songs by groups that they were inspired by. In an interview with Necro Butcher, he claims that they were essentially learning the instruments as they went and that their sound was closer to punk than to metal. They had not yet found their dark sound, and this boils down to inexperience and their vocalists. On their first demo, Euronymous was their lead vocalist, but after it was released, they decided to search for some session vocalists to improve their sound. The two that they found were Eric Billy Norhain, otherwise known as Messiah, and Sven Eric Christensen, otherwise known as Maniac. Norheim practiced with them multiple times, but only played one show with them in 1985 before eventually quitting to focus on other musical endeavors. Maniac, on the other hand, stayed with the band for a few years and was their lead vocalist when they recorded their first EP in 1987, known as Death Crush. This seven-track project definitely had darker undertones than most metal records at the time, but it was only a glimpse into the shocking music that Mayhem were truly capable of making. While some of their lyrics were dark and satanic, the instrumentation was a bit less abrasive and the imagery was a bit more low-key and toned down, but the EP was still very raw. 
In the book known as Black Metal, Evolution of the Cult by Dale Peterson, Monheim stated that the sound technician they worked with had never recorded music that was this heavy and basically didn't know how to record it properly. This also meant that the music was not mixed and that nothing was overdubbed. Today, this would be a cardinal sin in the world of music, but in this case, it actually helped the record sound more raw and authentic and it made for a pretty decent death metal EP that sold around a thousand copies in Norway. Still, despite their sound being dark and controversial, they hadn't pushed the envelope enough and still hadn't developed into the full-on black metal band they were to become. Before that would happen, significant changes would be made to Mayhem's lineup. In 1988, Monheim left the band and was replaced by Jan Axel Bloomberg, otherwise known as Hellhammer. Maniac, who had established himself as a competent vocalist on Death Crush, would also leave the band, and his replacement would help change the direction of mayhem and black metal forever. Morbid only released one demo with Dead, known as December Moon, released in 1987, but this was more than enough to showcase the potential that Dead had as a vocalist. His voice was dark and menacing, even at 18 years old, and even though this four-track project was basically a raw experiment as opposed to a polished piece of work, it was more than enough to show what Dead was capable of doing. After this demo was released, Olin felt as if Morbid weren't going anywhere, and he wanted to be a part of something bigger and more established. His answer was mayhem. According to Necro Butcher, Dead sent him a package that contained the Morbid demo, a letter containing his plans for the future, and a decomposing rat. Obviously this was bizarre, but the demo was definitely good enough. They invited him to join the group, and in 1988, Dead moved to Norway and replaced Maniac as the lead vocalist of Mayhem. It didn't take long for the band members to realize how strange Dead truly was. They would reflect on this years later in interviews. I'm not sure I knew Pella, the other Pella. Dead Pella we knew very well, and I guess the whole world, uh, which are interested in Mayhem or in black metal in general, they know uh, the image of, of Dead in Mayhem and his lyrics and, and what he stood for. But uh, the private peddler was a strange guy. And the first time I met him, I, was, I, I got angry because I'm a kind of light-minded. I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying life. He did not, <laughs> really did not. He was kind of depressed. But he, that's, that was something he, he just dressed up and uh, it was an image. Uh, he was depressed. He was looking for death. Regardless of how morbid and strange he was, his talent and intensity as a vocalist was undeniable, and his dark image played a big part in transforming, or at the very least, emphasizing Mayhem's aesthetic and sound. By the time Mayhem entered the stage with Dead for the first time in 1990, their image had become darker and more intense. A lot of this boiled down to who Dead was as a person. As stated previously, he was obsessed with the idea of death, and because of this, he would harm himself on stage and around his friends. His bandmates and friends did not like this and were understandably concerned, but Euronymous was fascinated by Dead and his antics and encouraged this kind of behavior to continue. According to the people who knew both Dead and Euronymous, they got on each other's nerves quite a bit. There were stories that they would torment each other, fight with each other, and there was even a bizarre claim that Dead had stabbed Euronymous while they lived together. A lot of these claims are difficult to prove, but the rumors and stories tell us that these two did not get along, and that Euronymous was usually the main aggressor in their disputes. It got to the stage where Euronymous was egging Dead on to take his own life an idea that he would unfortunately follow through with. In 1991, Dead, Euronymous, and Hellhammer were living near the small village of Krakstad in a rural house that was in the woods. As previously mentioned, Euronymous and Dead were getting on each other's nerves, and this home was becoming a difficult environment to live in. Hellhammer stated that Dead just sat in his room and became more and more depressed. 
On the 8th of April 1991, Dead was left alone in the house and decided to take his own life, leaving behind a bizarre note that said, excuse the blood. The note also contains some bizarre statements from a man who was clearly in need of some help. These included statements like, I belong in the woods, and I've always done so. No one will understand the reason for this anyway. To give some semblance of an explanation, I'm not a human. This is just a dream, and soon I will awake. He was only 22 years of age. Euronymous was the first one to come home and find him, and his reaction was bizarre. As stated earlier, he was obsessed with how dark and morbid Dead was, and to come home and find out that he had taken his own life was actually a pleasant surprise for Euronymous. So much so that before calling the authorities, he went to a local shop and purchased a disposable camera that he used to take pictures of Dead's body. He also allegedly took some of his bones and made necklaces out of them, a story that the band has since confirmed to be true. The next day, Euronymous called Necro Butcher and informed him of Pele's death. In an interview with The Guardian in 2005, he explained what it was like to get the news. Aistine called me up the next day and says, Dead has done something really cool. He killed himself. I thought, have you lost it? What do you mean cool? He says, relax, I have photos of everything. I was in shock and grief. He was just thinking how to exploit it. So I told him, okay, don't even call me before you destroy those pictures. Euronymous claimed that he would get rid of the pictures, but he never did, and Necro Butcher ended up leaving Mayhem because of this. This meant that half of Mayhem were now gone, and it seemed as if the band would naturally fade away, but Euronymous had other plans, and if anything, he was only getting started. In his eyes, the death of Pele was a positive turning point for both Mayhem and Black Metal. He started to go on a crusade to preach the importance of black metal and what it meant to be a part of this genre, using the death of his former bandmate to his advantage and claiming that Dead took his own life because black metal had become too trendy and commercial. Now, it should be noted that Dead was definitely critical of certain artists, and he believed that bandwagoners were a very real thing in the metal community. But while he opposed trends, he didn't necessarily oppose the idea of Mayhem or other black metal bands becoming commercially successful. In 2016, a former pen pal of Dead, who had direct correspondence with him, released a collection of letters that he had sent to him while he was alive. These letters were pretty revealing, and we learn a lot about Dead by reading them, but one thing is for sure sure, he was very focused on the sales and success of Mayhem. Like any passionate musician, he wanted his music to do well, and he constantly referenced his distribution plans, the sales figures that Mayhem were achieving, and other black metal bands that were doing well at the time. The reason I'm making this point is that Euronymous wanted people to believe that Dead took his own life because black metal was becoming too successful, and that simply wasn't true. It pretty much goes without saying, but Euronymous used Dead's passing to further his own agenda and emphasize his own elitism. He was able to convince people that black metal was something worth dying for, and he now had an actual martyr to go along with his story. And it worked. With his newfound notoriety, Euronymous opened up a record store in the summer of 1991 known as Helvetha, or Hell in English. He also used this store as the headquarters for his record label, Death Like Silence Productions, which was relatively inactive before Hilveta opened up, but it was now ready to fully embrace and support the black metal revival. The store also served as a location where like-minded musicians could meet, which helped Euronymous revive Mayhem from the ashes by finding suitable replacements. By 1992, they had a full lineup again, and they were ready to resume recording. Snore Rush, otherwise known as Blackthorn, joined as a guitarist, and Attila Chihara became their new lead vocalist. They still needed a bassist, however, and unfortunately for Euronymous and for Mayhem, the person they chose for that spot would not only play for the band, but would also help set off a chain of events that would destroy the band. In 1991, an 18-year-old known as Varg Vikernis created the one-man group known as Burzum. A year later, in 1992, he released a self-titled project under that name, and it was clear from the get-go that Varg was an exceptionally talented, well-rounded musician who at 19 years of age was crafting some of the best atmospheric black metal of his time. At this stage, Euronymous had created what was described as a black metal inner circle, and he was the de facto leader of it. It was a small clique of musicians, and in Euronymous's case, it was a great way to source potential talent for Mayhem, and Varg, being one of the most talented young musicians in the scene, was a perfect fit for the band. 
He joined as a bassist in 1992. Euronymous was more powerful than ever. His band, his label, his store, and his inner circle were all working in his favor. He had essentially created a well-oiled machine that was especially designed for him, and because of this, he started to make a list of rules and regulations that you had to follow in order to be a real member of the scene. The main rule was that you had to be a Satanist. He didn't even care about what kind of metal you were making. As long as you practiced actual Satanism, he considered you a part of the black metal scene. He said, If a band cultivates and worships Satan, it's black metal. In a way, it can be ordinary heavy metal or just noise. What's important is that it's satanic. That's what makes it black metal. Another strange rule he had was that his listeners had to be deemed worthy to listen to Mayhem's music. In multiple interviews, he talked about listeners who were unworthy and therefore should not listen to black metal. Der jag lost to ett spörsel efter skiva då och den har ju gått för upp till 1500 kronor på svarta marknaden. Och vi menar att den gången den skiva kom ut så var det kanske en 20-30 man som fick tak i plåtan som förtjänte att äga den och resten av de som fick tak i den är en hel haug med idioter. This kind of elitism gave the genre an alluring but exclusive energy that added to the already insane image that black metal had, but probably did more harm than good and stopped potential fans from enjoying these artists' work. However, a lot of people were willing to follow these guidelines, and it did nothing but add to the cult leader-like status that Euronymous had created. He was on top of the totem pole, and his ego was at an all-time high. Understandably, tensions started to rise and Euronymous' image became a confusing one, with some people thinking that he was a god, while others believed that he was an egomaniac on a power trip. Many members of the black metal community started to criticize his way of thinking. One of these critics was Varg, who still worked and associated with Euronymous, but that did not stop a power struggle from brewing. It's widely believed and reported that Varg wanted the power that Euronymous had, but with him owning the store, the band, and the label, the cards were all in his hands. Whether this power struggle theory is true or not, it was fueled by an insane chain of events that would ultimately lead to a murder. It's not surprising that black metal wasn't the most commercially successful genre of music in the early 90s. The exclusive nature and the abrasive sound made it a difficult genre to be a part of, and in the eyes of some of the musicians, the only way to really promote it was to embrace this stereotype further and generate enough controversy so that journalists would write about black metal. According to a blog that Varg wrote in 2004 while he was in prison, he hatched a plan with Euronymous to promote the Helveta store and attract more fans to the genre. Under his pseudonym, Varg gave an interview to a Norwegian newspaper, and in it, he claimed that he was responsible for the burning of a church and that he had killed a man in the town of Lillehammer. In 1992, almost a dozen churches were burned down in Norway, and in many cases, the culprit was still a mystery. On top of this, a man actually was murdered in 1992 in Lillehammer, but this was done by another black metal musician known as Bard Faust. That did not stop Varg from taking credit for these crimes, at least anonymously. This interview served as a confession that members of the black metal community were responsible for these church burnings, and the intention was to make the interview as provocative as possible so that it would promote black metal to the masses. Well, it essentially worked. A media spotlight was now on the genre, but there was also a target on their heads. Varg was quickly arrested under suspicion of committing these crimes, along with other members of the black metal community, and allegedly, Euronymous's parents told him to shut down the shop as to avoid any unnecessary attention, meaning their misguided attempt at some free promotion was essentially an utter failure. Varg was eventually released in March of 1993, and at this stage, he was essentially done with Euronymous. They had already had a dispute about money a year prior, and this was the tip of the iceberg. He explains his growing dislike for Euronymous in the same blog post that he wrote about the interview. Euronymous had made a complete fool of himself by closing down the shop and most of us agreed that he was a damn wimp and an idiot. I was angry at him for not taking advantage of the situation, which was why I had done that silly interview in the first place, and I didn't want anything more to do with him. 
As far as I was concerned, he didn't exist anymore. For some months, this dislike for Euronymous spread in the metal scene as more and more people understood what a moron he was. And he blamed me for all of this and started to hate me. He believed it was my fault that people lost their respect for him. In a sense, he was right, as I certainly didn't keep my opinions a secret. But I think he brought that upon himself. He was simply disclosed by the way he reacted to the heat. He had made a fool of himself. Further, when the media wrote all that crap about me, it made him feel less important. Suddenly, he was no longer the main character in the hardcore metal scene. As he saw it, that too was my fault. According to Varg, Euronymous was so angry that he hatched a plan to kill him, and when Varg caught wind of this, he wanted to confront Euronymous and put this behind him. They had a contract that Varg needed to sign, and Euronymous invited him to meet him in person. Instead of setting a time and a place, Varg just drove to Oslo unannounced with Snor, the guitarist for Mayhem at the time. When they arrived at the apartment, an insane series of events unfolded, and there are multiple different accounts of what happened, so for the sake of being fair and thorough, we'll run through the different possible scenarios. First, there is Varg's retelling of the night, which he wrote about in this blog post, I gave chase stabbed him, and was a bit surprised when he ran out of the apartment instead. It made no sense to flee, and it made me angry to know that he had started the fight, but the moment it didn't go his way, he decided to flee instead, instead of fighting like a man. Such is always something I have disliked strongly. He had showed his intention to kill me, and even though he was no longer a direct threat to me, there and then, I did not feel any bad for killing him. His cowardice had made me angry, and I saw no reason to let him live. Not when he had showed his intent to kill me. Had I let him live, I would only let him have another attempt at my life later on. This blog post made the self-defense theory more difficult to justify, and it's important to remember that this is coming from the man who actually committed the murder, which is obviously a very biased source. What's important about this blog post and Varg's confession in general is that he claims that he was the only person responsible for the death of Euronymous and that he had no original intention to kill him. This is a vital piece of information because the other account of this night is wildly different. Both Varg and Snor were eventually arrested for the murder of Euronymous, and the police wanted a confession from both of them. At first, Snor denied having any involvement in the crime, but eventually he changed his story and he admitted that Varg had planned to kill him all along and that he persuaded Snor into being an accomplice. This is the story that the jury bought, and Snor was sentenced to 8 years in prison, while Varg was sentenced to 21 years in prison, a sentence that included charges for arson, as he was also convicted of multiple church burnings that happened a year prior. The answer probably lies in between both of these stories, and it wouldn't be surprising if there was indiscrepancies and inconsistencies in both of these accounts. By the sounds of it, Snor was probably in the wrong place at the wrong time, but Varg's self-defense claim is also quite flimsy when you zoom out. But the result was the same. Euronymous was dead, and the black metal community, and Mayhem, would never be the same again. It was a sad tale of ego, power, and what it all ultimately leads to, death. At this stage, I'm sure you're asking yourself why we haven't talked about actual music for almost 20 minutes. And the answer to that is there was barely any Mayhem music to talk about. Throughout all of this carnage and all of this bloodshed, Mayhem hadn't released an official studio album. They had some demos, recorded rehearsals, and live shows, but it wouldn't be until 1994, a year after Euronymous was buried, that Necro Butcher and Hellhammer came together to finally release their first album. The Mysteries Dom Satanos, a Latin phrase that means about the mysteries of the Lord Satan, a strangely fitting name given the circumstances. This may have been the best thing that Mayhem ever made, and it was one of the most culturally significant and important black metal albums of all time. It was dark, fast-paced, well-crafted, and thought-provoking. It was the culmination of seven years of absolute insanity, and it had a baffling lineup. Almost everybody we talked about had a part to play on this album. Hellhammer supplied the drums, Attila Chehara was the vocalist, Dead and Necro Butcher were credited writers, Varg was the bassist, and Euronymous was the guitarist. After everything that had happened, after all of the fights, the insults, the suicide, and the murder, they were all together for a final time. 
Mayhem are still active today, with Necro Butcher being their only original member left, but nothing would top this album. It was truly a phenomenon, and it's one that I highly recommend you listen to. A group of men in their early 20s had changed the landscape of metal forever, but lives were ruined and destroyed in the process. A sacrifice that I'm sure most of them were unhappy with, but some of them probably didn't mind. Horrorcore, a subgenre of hip hop where rappers will take their lyrics, imagery, and messaging to the darkest brinks that they can possibly imagine. At times, this genre gives us some hard hitting, intense storytelling that is both effective and artistic. Other times, it can be a bit gimmicky and seem more like a competition to say the most messed up thing possible, even if it means nothing. However, there is another category of horrorcore that has made the genre as controversial as it is, and that's when artists actually do the things that they are rapping about. Today we'll be talking about Big Lurch, an artist whose crime was more intense and disturbing than anything he ever rapped about. A crime that included class A drug use, murder, and actual cannibalism. This crime greatly overshadowed the career of Big Lurch, so unlike other episodes where we dive deep into their musical career, we're instead going to cover that briefly before jumping right into this insane case, because trust me, there is more than meets the eye when it comes to the case of Big Lurch. Antron Singleton was born on the 15th of September, 1976 in Fort Worth, Texas. He had an early interest in poetry, but in the 80s, this turned into a passion for hip-hop and he started rapping under the alias G Spade. This would later become Big Lurch because of how tall he was, standing at around 6 foot 6 in size. In retrospect, Lurch had a lot of success in the 90s from an underground perspective, and he wasn't even really doing horrorcore at the time. He started collaborating with the likes of E-40, RBL Posse, Mystical, and Too Short. Many of these artists are still well known today and had a huge impact on the hip-hop scene in the 90s, specifically in the West Coast. Big Lurch wasn't as well known as some of his contemporaries, but he was right there with them, collaborating, networking, and rubbing shoulders with some of hip-hop's biggest names. On top of this, he was quite talented and sounded right at home with the rappers he collaborated with. Apart from his solo career, Lurch formed a group with two other musicians, Dooney Baby and Rick Rock. Together they created the trio known as Cosmic Slop Shop and released one studio album, The Family. From everything I was able to find, this album was also quite good and definitely well put together. Unfortunately, this didn't translate to sales and the album wasn't that successful. They had one song called Sinful that did decent numbers and got a small bit of radio play, but apart from that, the Cosmic Slop Shop weren't all that successful and although there was a lot of potential and talent within the group, the numbers weren't there and the group disbanded in 1999. That was the end of Lurch's musical endeavors in the 90s, and although he wasn't a famous artist by any stretch, that particular decade wasn't all bad. He got his foot in the door, collaborated with quite a few accomplished rappers, and managed to release a full studio album through a record label with a group that he helped create. It looked like the 2000s might have been the decade that Lurch could truly find his success, but it started off in the exact opposite direction. On the 16th of September 2000, Antron was hit by a drunk driver and was badly injured. In order to cope with the pain that his crash brought him, he started taking PCP, otherwise known as Angel Dust, a highly addictive hallucinogenic drug that also numbs the user. Although it could technically be used to numb somebody's pain, PCP is one of the most intense drugs in the world, as we've learned with so many cases where people do insane things. While well, unfortunately for Lurch and those around him, he would be right in the midst of this insanity less than 18 months after his car crash. In the early 2000s, Big Lurch had started to perform horrorcore music. It wasn't a new genre by any means of the imagination, and he had definitely dabbled in it before, but he was ready to make a full project in the subgenre. While he was recording this project, he was living in a Los Angeles apartment with a few friends, including 21-year-old Tanisha Yesias and her boyfriend Thomas Moore. On April 9th, 2002, Thomas Moore and Antron started smoking PCP together. 
According to Antron and almost all of the people who were in the apartment that night, what actually happened was a blur, but the next morning, one of Tanisha's friends, Alyssa Allen, entered the apartment and found Tanisha's body. Her chest had been torn open. Tooth marks were found on her body and small parts of her remains were seemingly missing. Shortly after this, Antron Singleton was found in the streets of LA near his apartment. He was completely naked, covered in blood, and he was screaming at the sky. He was immediately apprehended and taken into custody. A medical exam was conducted that showed that Singleton had recently consumed flesh that was not his. At first glance, this case was open and shut. Antron Singleton had taken PCP with his friends, and a few hours later, he killed and ate parts of his roommate. Now, it is more convoluted than that, and we'll talk about that soon, but as far as the justice system was concerned, this was more than enough. Singleton pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, but this defense failed, and in 2003, he was found guilty of murder and aggravated mayhem, and was subsequently sent to life in prison without the possibility of parole. As I mentioned previously, Antron was working on a horrorcore album, and unfortunately for him, some of these songs were used against him in court. Specifically the song, I Did It To You a song where he talked about murder in a cold and unabashedful way and compared himself to multiple different fictional horror characters and real-life serial killers. This song was from the album It's All Bad, and it was actually released by the label that he was working with a year after he was sentenced. A very strange and morbid promotional tactic they used was through the album artwork of this record. It was a Photoshop picture of Big Lurch holding a platter with a human skull on top of it, very obviously alluding to the horrid crime that he had committed. It was around this time that people started to ask some questions. The label were obviously trying to profit off this crime, and this put some interesting question marks on the case. The more people looked, the more people found, and as it turns out, there was a lot more discrepancies with this case than people think. Big Lurch didn't necessarily profess his innocence immediately. However, he always claimed that he had no idea what had happened on that night, and that it's entirely possible that there was a lot more to this story. The first reason there may have been some discrepancies was his label. He was signed to a record company called Black Market Records from Sacramento, and it's safe to say that they had quite the reputation. They would promote their artists as dangerous criminals, and they did everything in their power to sell this gangster image to the masses. We already talked about the disturbing album artwork that they released, but what you might not know is that Black Market Records had actually done this before with another artist named X-Rated. Rated was another rapper from the Sacramento area who went to prison around 10 years prior for murder. Black Market Records, his label at the time, released four albums while he was behind bars, and although it was apparent that X-Rated was involved in most of this, it's also very clear that Black Market Records were willing to market his music in whatever way possible. Allegedly, they did the same thing to Big Lurch. Apparently, when they found out that he was smoking PCP for his pain, they decided to provide him with even more drugs in order to authenticate his gangster image and make his music more believable. This same argument was made by Tanisha's mother, Carolyn Stinson, who actually filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the label, claiming that they had fed Antron the drugs that led him to do this. This lawsuit didn't really go anywhere, but this theory remained quite popular for a while. However, it's not the most popular alternative to what happened that night. A documentary called Big Lurch, Rhyme and Punishment was released in 2011, and Big Lurch and Tanisha's mother told us a different side of the story. As far as her boyfriend, he was a gay member, I believe. He the one set all this up. He was beating on her. She had all her stuff packed, ready to leave the day all this happened. They got me high on purpose to take advantage of me. She got hit in the back of the neck with a, um, one of the little kid's scooters because a handprint was on the scooter, bloody handprint, but they said they didn't know who that was, but it wasn't his. It's not even no proof that I actually did the murder. My prince wasn't on her weapon. It was a dope house. They didn't find no dope in the dope house, though. She didn't smoke the PCP. It was like somebody pulled it down. You know, the bottle was pulled down her throat because she had so much in her system. They said ain't no way. She could have smoked that. Footprints, fingerprints on doors, you know, bloody fingerprints. 
you know, shoe at the back door, you know, and it's like, where all this evidence go? It was DNA, who DNA was. They said DNA came up lost. So they made it look like he did all this work to her. There's no way he could have done that work because the way she was messed up, hatred had to been there. And like he said, he didn't hate her. All right, so that's a lot to digest, so let's quickly break down everything that was just said. Firstly, Carolyn Stinson claims that Tanisha's boyfriend, Thomas Moore, was the man who orchestrated this killing. Apparently, they had been fighting both verbally and physically, and Tanisha was more than ready to leave the apartment and the relationship. Antron also believes that he was set up because of the amount of PCP found in his system and her system. According to the medical examination, it was a surreal amount of PCP, and this immediately raised some eyebrows. Secondly, there was a lot of details about the case that was oddly looked over. For example, as Carolyn mentions in the clip, there was a bloody handprint on the scooter that was used in the attack. This handprint did not match Antron's hand, but it was never looked into further. There was also footprints and fingerprints around the actual crime scene that again was not looked into. Furthermore, the tooth marks on the actual body did not match the teeth of Antron and he actually believes that they more than likely belong to a baby pit bull that lived in the apartment as well. On top of all of this, there was a lone shoe that was found right by the crime scene that didn't belong to Antron or Tanisha and this again was not investigated further. It seems like at the very least there was a lot of negligence when it came to this case. Big Lurch did a 36 minute interview with Vlad TV where he spoke about this case further and claimed the only reason he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity was because his lawyer told him to do so. Since his incarceration, Big Lurch has been studying the law himself to try and get a retrial. So far this has been unsuccessful, but based on a letter I found that he sent to a fan, he is still optimistic and hopes that a retrial will happen. In all honesty, based on the evidence that wasn't analyzed and the facts that were ignored, it does seem like a retrial should happen. I'm not saying that anybody is innocent or guilty, but when you look at the facts that were ignored, it's clear that there could be something else that happened on that night, and we may not have all the answers. Regardless of the mystery that surrounds that night, the results were the same, and they're absolutely horrific. It was honestly hard to read about the details of that night because of how intense and disturbing they were, and this case has been remembered as one of the darkest moments in hip-hop's history. The year is 1992. A 26-year-old musician paces around his studio, working on his next musical project. He does this in secret, because he is a signed musician who works for a label that wants him to create a light, digestible project for the masses. Instead, he does the opposite, making the darkest sound that he can possibly conceive, bouncing from studio to studio, working under pseudonyms so that the label doesn't find out what he's doing. And after carefully crafting six dark, intense tracks, he gets to work on a collection of music videos. He teams up with a director that can help him see his vision, and together, they create a 20-minute musical short film that has gone down in history as one of the most disturbing pieces of media ever made. It was ultimately shelved, being deemed too disturbing to watch, but eventually it was leaked, and today we have access to the entire thing, and after watching it myself, I can tell you that this is not a video for the faint of heart. It is a product of frustration, an expression of rage, and a middle finger from a man who truly loathed the industry that he was in. That man was none other than Trent Reznor, the musical project in question was for his band Nine Inch Nails, and the video that we are going to be talking about today was simply titled, Broken. But first, an explanation. Trent Reznor was always a little bit different. He was born in 1965 in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, a town with around 40,000 people. He was raised by his maternal grandparents, who described him as a creative but introverted kid. He was a child who immediately disliked the boundaries that he was placed in, a small town where nothing happened. His only escape was the media that he consumed. My life experience came from watching movies, watching TV, and reading books. When your culture comes from watching television every day, you're bombarded with images of things that seem cool, places that seem interesting, people who have jobs and careers and opportunities. None of that happened where I was. You're almost taught to realize it's not for you. 
Creating music, on the other hand, was for him. From the age of five, he was playing piano. In high school, he picked up the saxophone, and by the time he was in his early 20s, he was playing in numerous different bands. Groups like Option, The Innocent, and Exotic Birds, where he played the keyboard and performed vocals. It seemed like he was doing anything to break away from the monotony that he hated so much. The rule set that he didn't want to follow could only be broken if he found some kind of success in his musical endeavors. In 1988, he was working as a janitor for Right Track Studios. The owner of the building, Bart Coster, allowed him to record there for free, and this is where he began to truly find his footing in music. He wasn't able to find bandmates who could help him create the sound that he wanted to make, but luckily, he didn't need any bandmates. He had learned enough instruments at this stage, and he was able to do it by himself. He meticulously crafted every single part of every single song. The only instrument he didn't actually play was the drums, which he would program in. He first created a 12-inch demo that attracted the attention of a label, TVT Records, who took many of the songs he had already recorded for an unreleased project called Pure as Feeling and revised them into a new project, Pretty Hate Machine. The album was released under the name Nine Inch Nails. Reznor said there was no particular reason for picking this name, it just had a nice ring to it and it was easy to abbreviate. Well, maybe it was the name or maybe it was the actual music, but the album was a moderate success. It charted at number 75 on the Billboard Top 200 and it received very positive reviews from critics, who praised the album for its elements of synth pop, the catchy riffs, and the production that not only came from Reznor, but also came from producers like Flood, Keith LeBlanc, Adrian Sherwood, and John Fryer. The album's 10 tracks were not only well received, but they were enough to take Nine Inch Nails on tour. Reznor compiled a group of bandmates and hit the road. The Pretty Hate Machine tour was in full effect, and I mean that in every sense. In 88, they opened for the band Skinny Puppy. In 89, they went on their own promotional tour. In 1990, they opened for The Jesus and Mary Chain, and then again for Peter Murphy. After that, they went on the Hate Tour and the Sin Tour, then Lollapalooza, and then a European tour. This set of shows lasted years, tour after tour after tour. It seemed like it would never end, a cycle that Trent Reznor had reluctantly stepped into. He left one matrix and entered another one contractual obligation after the next. It was non-stop. And I thought that maybe when I reached all these goals, I'd find some sort of peace. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. You know, it's like I'm more miserable now than I ever was. By all accounts, his label was satisfied. This is what they wanted, and if anything, they wanted more. In the early 90s, TVT Records asked Trent Reznor to make a new Nine Inch Nails album, one that sounded similar to Pretty Hate Machine, but even lighter and more digestible. They wanted to fully capitalize off a sound that Trent Reznor was now reluctant to make. He had just spent three years touring this exact album and wanted to make a different type of record, but TVT wanted him to be more commercial, more accessible, and create a full-blown synth-pop record. It was a war of ideas, and it pushed Reznor to a place where he wanted to make a project that was darker than anything he had ever made. And that's exactly what he did. Trent Reznor took the money that he had made from touring and decided to invest it into a new project, one that his label had no idea he was making. He secretly jumped around different studios with various different producers and started to formulate an entirely new project, a six-track EP called Broken, which actually ended up being eight songs after all was said and done. This EP sounded completely different to anything that he had ever released. The instrumentals were harsher than ever before, the lyrics were gritty and to the point, and the overall vibe of the project was the exact opposite of what the label wanted. There was no way that they were going to approve it. Steve Gottlieb, the owner and founder of TVT Records, borderline hated Trent Reznor at this point, and the feeling was seemingly mutual. It looked like Reznor's future projects were going to be shelved and he would be ostracized from the music industry for being hard to work with. But little did he know, there was a man in the background who was watching all of this unfold, and he was waiting for the right moment to swoop in. This man was Jimmy Iovine, who first heard Nine Inch Nails in 1991 and was interested in signing Trent Reznor to his newfound label, Interscope Records. The problem was that Nine Inch Nails were signed to a seven-album deal, and even if Jimmy Iovine could convince Steve Gottlieb to let Nine Inch Nails go, he would then have to convince Trent Reznor to sign a completely new deal, and at this stage, Reznor wanted absolutely nothing to do with record companies at all. 
It was going to be very difficult to negotiate such a complicated deal, but Jimmy Iovine threw everything at the wall, and for around a year, he called every single party involved every single day. Reznor, Gottlieb, the lawyers, anybody who had anything to do with getting this deal done was contacted by Iveen every single day. He heard every side, came up with solutions, and finally managed to draft a contract that somewhat satisfied all parties involved. The idea was this, buy out the original contract, create a new deal for one album, and then create an exclusive contract for Nine Inch Nails after the initial deal was done. Essentially, TVT and Interscope were going to come together for the next album, but TVT would have very little control. After that, Trent Reznor and Steve Gottlieb would go their separate ways. Like I said, very complicated deal, but it got done and finally, Jimmy Iovine and Trent Reznor met in person to discuss the future. Reznor was understandably skeptical and wanted to test this so-called freedom that Jimmy Iovine was offering at Interscope. First, he asked for complete creative control. No oversight, no orders, he would just make the music and give it to the label and that was it. Jimmy Iovine said yes. Then, Reznor asked for his own label so that he could sign any artist that he wanted to work with. Again, Jimmy Iovine said yes. Reznor was pleasantly surprised, and in response to this, he gave Interscope Records the project he had been working on in secret, the Broken EP. A lot of people might not know this, but this EP was actually a lifesaver to Interscope Records. The label was essentially hemorrhaging money in 1992, and this project, and the fact that they had just successfully signed Nine Inch Nails, was a huge turning point for the company. So even though it may seem like a small EP made out of rage and anger, it actually has a very significant place in music history. But, of course, there is another reason why this EP became notorious. Like I said, Reznor wanted to test his newfound freedom, and although he was satisfied with the conversation that he had just had with Jimmy Iovine, he was not totally convinced, and in 1993, he set out to create something that would truly test the boundaries of his creative liberties and artistic expression in general. Because what is a better way to test how far you can go than making one of the most disturbing pieces of media that anybody has ever seen? Trent Reznor teamed up with filmmaker John Reese to create the Happiness in Slavery music video. This was a pretty grotesque video that we'll discuss in full later, but for now I will simply say that it was very intense and there was no way that this could be aired on a station like MTV or really any television station at all. Reznor was not only okay with this, but he wanted to make something even darker. Something that would truly prove how much of a wild card he was to work with and possibly deter labels from wanting to work with him in any capacity. He hired Peter Christofferson to help him with this and together, they started to conceptualize a 20 minute short film simply titled The Broken Movie, which would be a collection of five music videos based on music from the EP. They sat down and had a conversation about the project and Reznor said the following about their discussion in an interview. He said, There was no label involvement or pressure from anyone. It was just he and I talking. What if we built up a framework around these songs? What if we took an approach where it was really scary, instead of a cop-out horror movie nod to the camera? What if it felt real? And that's exactly what they did. The video is done in five acts and it goes as follows. The video begins, and we see a man in handcuffs being executed. We're not sure why he's here or what he has done, but clearly it was enough to warrant the death penalty. We then see shots of what looks like a suburban estate with ominous music playing in the background. This happens for around 30 seconds, until we see a man walk towards the camera in a confused state. It quickly cuts to a much darker place, an eerie looking basement that has a single chair in the middle of it. In that chair is the man that we just saw and a masked person who circles around him. It's evident that he has just been kidnapped. Instead of torturing him, the masked man walks towards a small television, picks up a remote, and begins to play a video. I can't actually show you the full thing, and that will be a reoccurring trend here. But the video shows a recreation of somebody being essentially drowned by what we can only hope is water. That is the first thing that the kidnapper shows to his victim, and as dark as that is, it is only the beginning. 
After the first video plays, a new one begins, and it's the music video for the song Wish. The video shows the band performing the track in the middle of a steel cage that is surrounded by a chaotic group of fans. Throughout the three minute performance, the audience are getting more and more rowdy, and near the end of the song, they start attempting to break into the cage in an attempt to get to the band. They eventually succeed in this endeavor, and the video ends abruptly. The last scene shows us the crowd, now in the cage, running towards the band. It cuts back to the torturer's basement, and he rewinds a certain part of the music video over and over again. Which is actually Trent Reznor singing a certain lyric of the song. That interesting clip concludes the second video, and although it's hard to imagine, the movie starts to take an even stranger turn from here. Help Me I Am In Hell is the next song that plays, and we get a rather fitting video for a pretty intense track. The video shows us a man staring intensely at the camera as flies swarm around him. He then attempts to have a steak and wine dinner, but for obvious reasons, he struggles. The video occasionally cuts to the same man in bondage, and after a couple of minutes, the video ends. And honestly, I can sort of see the method to the madness when it comes to most of these videos, but this one is definitely a head-scratcher. After this video, we go back to the torturer's basement and see one of the most brutal scenes of the entire movie, when the torturer literally tears his victim's teeth out. It is a tough watch to say the least, and I obviously can't show you the entire clip, but trust me, that is for the best. Act 4 begins and we see Trent Reznor locked in a cage screaming the words to happiness in slavery. A very fitting title considering the video we are about to discuss. A man in a suit walks into a dark, desolate room and lights a candle. He then lies down on what seems to be a surgical bed. At this point, various different clamps and spikes start to attack the man's body, and slowly but surely, they rip him apart until he eventually dies. His body is then put through some sort of meat churner and turned into some kind of mush. After this grueling process, Trent Reznor himself walks into the same room and picks up a candle, insinuating that this is some kind of sick process that these people are being forced to go through, and that this will not be the last time somebody dies in such a devastating fashion. This was the music video I referred to earlier, and it was essentially the reason that this movie exists. And when I watched it at first, I was intrigued to say the least. There's literally no way that this video could air on any station. And yet the effects, the acting, and the general effort in this video are commendable. It's well shot, well produced, and well edited, which is fascinating when you consider that it's almost unusable from a marketing point of view. That is a running theme in this movie that I think deserves some level of respect, but I'll talk about that more later because we do still have one more act to get through, the final chapter of this insane movie. The final act begins and we get a clip of a fridge filled with some interesting looking meat and the head from the first music video. It then cuts to the torturer attacking his victim. Up until now, most of these clips have been slow and short, but these clips are spliced together in quick succession, and the song that's playing, Gave Up, is a fast-paced track that fits the scene perfectly. A police officer then walks into the house to investigate the scene, and immediately covers his mouth because of the stench. From here, the video cuts from the torture back to the police officer in the house. It's interesting to note that these scenes are some of the best looking videos in the whole movie, while the footage from the torturer's basement is grainier than ever before. These clips are quickly cut side by side, which makes for an interesting juxtaposition. When the killer is finally finished with his victim, we see one last clip of him basking in his work. And then finally, the video ends. It cuts to one last shot, the clip that we saw at the beginning, the execution. All of the videos that the man showed to his victim were made by him. He was essentially showing off the cruel ways that he had killed his prey before eventually taking another life. This was most likely his last victim before he himself was finally killed. I have covered a lot of disturbing media on this channel, but this specific movie has some of the darkest, grittiest footage I have ever seen, and I honestly look forward to the day that it is wiped from my memory. I mentioned this a little bit already, but one of the most interesting parts about this project is how unsalvageable it is from a promotional point of view. While a couple of the shorter videos at the beginning were released in a limited fashion, the second half of this movie was never released in any capacity. Simply put, it would have been so censored to the point that it would essentially be a completely different video. 
The reason I said that this deserves some level of respect is because this was the early 90s. The internet was not a widely used promotional tool, so even trying to market this movie through the lens of morbid curiosity was virtually impossible. This was simply a hindrance to the career of Trent Reznor, who actually stopped any release from happening himself because of how intense it turned out. We didn't know it would look so real. At the time, we felt releasing it would cause an uproar of attention that would overshadow what I was trying to do musically. How real it looked was actually a genuine concern at the time. Reznor later said that he was worried people would believe this was an authentic snuff film. And while that may seem a little silly today, this was made 30 years ago. I can only imagine stumbling onto a cassette tape and seeing this film on it, not knowing what it is, especially if it was cut up in a certain way. It truly was a dangerous piece of footage at the time, and I can fully understand why it was never given an official release. Reznor actually did make an alternative visual for the song Gave Up, which was a simple enough performance video featuring Marilyn Manson that he recorded at the house he was living in at the time. That house was actually the residence that Sharon Tate lived in when she was killed by Charles Manson's cult. Even though this is an edgy premise for a music video, it doesn't even come close to the visuals that we see in the broken movie, and to this date, it's the most disturbing thing that Trent Reznor has ever made, and it's unlikely to change. Nine Inch Nails' next album after this was The Downward Spiral in 1994. This was a huge commercial success, debuting at number two on the Billboard Top 200 and truly establishing Nine Inch Nails as one of the biggest bands of the 1990s. To this day, many fans consider this album to be Trent Reznor's best work, and unsurprisingly, it was also a dark, disturbing, distorted project. When you put this all together and you realize that the broken EP, the movie, and this album were all made in the space of roughly two years, you start to see the kind of headspace that Reznor was in at the time. It truly was a manic and chaotic period of his life, and artistically, these projects were the result. Nine Inch Nails are easily the most commercially successful band or musical act I have ever covered on this series, and for that reason, I don't really feel the need to delve deep into the rest of their career. 20 million albums sold, multiple top 5 records, and to top it off, Atticus Ross and Trent Reznor have teamed up multiple times to score various different movies, like Mid-90s, Gone Girl, and my favorite movie soundtrack of all time, The Social Network, which they actually won an Academy Award for. That's just the footnotes, but like I said, it's all very well documented, and that's not really what the point of this series is, so I'll just leave that there. At this point, I would usually tell you to go check out the material I was talking about, but for obvious reasons, I can't do that, so I'll just recommend The Broken EP. It's a solid piece of work, and it's definitely worth a listen. Two of the songs even went on to win Grammys, and the project was well respected by critics. I wonder how many of them knew that right behind that project was one of the darkest short movies ever made, living eerily in the shadows. And to be perfectly honest, after dissecting it this much, I think that might be just where it belongs. The 1980s saw an influx of noise rock and experimental music in Japan that would take the underground scene by storm. With artists being more brash, courageous, and downright chaotic in their sound and performances. One of the standout groups in this decade was Hana Tarash a group that formed in 1984 in Osaka and really pushed the norms of what music was at the time. Now, I've said that exact statement quite a bit when talking about the music that we discuss, whether that be Mayhem, Satan Panonsky, or Gigi Allen. And while it may be a true statement when talking about those acts, Hannah Tarash were on a different level entirely. Their performances and music were the embodiment of chaos, and some would say the embodiment of true noise punk in general. The insanity they brought on stage was all a part of the act and the music, and this led to some of the most dangerous and destructive live performances in music history, with one of their most famous moments coming from a show where they literally bulldozed into the back of a building while performing. Believe it or not, that is just a footnote in this band's history. And before we talk about it, let's talk about the history of Hannah Tarash. The band consisted of just two members, guitarist Mitsuru Tabata and frontman Yamantaka Ai. The two actually met at an Einstrutzende Nubatten gig, a German band that were also very experimental in nature and were almost definitely a big influence for Hannah Tarash. In general, it seemed like the duo had a similar music taste and a common goal, 
Just like their contemporaries, they would implement normal everyday objects into their music. Things like power tools, drills, barrels, saws, and pretty much any strange object they could get their hands on. In a way, it was a liberating concept. Anything that was nearby could be used as an instrument and added to their music. This was definitely apparent in their first album. Hannah Tarash I, otherwise known as Hannah Tarash One. This was the first of three albums that they would create throughout the 80s, the other ones being Hannah Tarash Two and Three. I've listened to all of these albums in full and it was definitely an interesting journey to say the least. Believe it or not, I tried to pick out one of the more musically cohesive moments I could find. But as you can probably tell from that soundbite, there aren't that many. Occasionally throughout the albums, you will hear a drum solo or two and maybe some loose vocals here and there. But besides that, the sounds come from completely random places and it seems like anything can happen at any time. Which was probably the case, as most of these records seem to be off the cuff and improvised. Although there are a lot of compelling and interesting moments, it can be a harrowing thing to listen to. And it seems like something you'd want to see being created instead of hearing it. And when it comes to Hannah Tarash, that is definitely the case. In the world of noise punk, intense live performances are to be expected. The chaotic nature of the genre almost calls for it. But Hannah Tarash were on a different level entirely. There are only a few clips I could find, but they give us a glimpse into the insane world of their live performances. From sticking the microphone in their mouth and screaming at the top of their lungs while the audience just stands there, to actually picking up panes of glass and throwing it in the direction of the audience. One of the more infamous moments happened when the frontman, I, strapped a circular saw to his body during a live gig. He was severely injured because of this and almost sawed his leg in half. In another gig, he brought a dead cat on stage that he found outside and threw it into the crowd. Those few events alone should let you know how dangerous these shows were becoming. Unfortunately, these gigs were not well documented, and most of the insane stories simply come from word of mouth, but the best example you will get from a footage perspective comes from this 30-minute clip titled Hanatara Shibuya Tokyo 1985. The video is obviously low resolution and it's hard to make out what's happening at times, but what we do see is pretty revealing. Slowly but surely, the duo destroy every single fragment of this stage, throwing barrels around, ripping up the floorboards, and near the end, they actually start to throw objects directly at the crowd, which seems to be a recurring theme at their live shows. Understandably, the people in the crowd start to quickly leave the premises, and at the end of the video, we see the staff of the venue solemnly clean up the destruction that has occurred. It is a great video, and it's a bit of a hidden gem because it not only shows the intensity of their performances, but it also shows the reality behind what they're doing. At this stage of their career, the crowd were literally signing waivers before they entered the venue that essentially absolved Hannah Tarash of any guilt if anything happened. That's how dangerous these shows were becoming, but they were still drawing in pretty big crowds. People obviously wanted to see what Hannah Tarash were like live, and it was that same year that they had arguably their most infamous performance, and it might be fair to say that this was also one of the most insane gigs that ever happened in music history. Although Hana Tarash were based in Osaka, they had played numerous high-profile gigs in the underground clubs of Tokyo and were cultivating a strong audience of people who wanted to see what they were going to do next. Well, they answered that question in a ferocious manner when they performed in a club in the summer of 1985 and bulldozed into the back of the building they were playing at. Although there is no video of this, there is a pretty insane slideshow of pictures that show us the carnage of this show. Yamantaka Ai was actually asked about this experience and he detailed it by saying the following. We got on this thing and rode it, bang, through the doors of the hall. It'll spin a full 360 degrees, so we were spinning and driving through the audience, chasing them around, when suddenly there was this wall we spun into and opened a rather large hole in. The wind came blowing in. The place was all concrete walls and no windows. We smashed everything. It's amazing, really, how little sound comes out of something you're smashing with all your might. So, yes, you heard that correctly, he actually chased the audience around with the bulldozer until eventually he got back on stage and continued his performance. What's interesting about this statement is he did remark on the actual sound. 
Since that was, in theory, the music that they were performing, it would make sense that he would care about it, but it's also quite comical to think that while he was chasing the crowd around with a literal bulldozer, he was also annoyed that it wasn't loud enough. After they performed on stage for a while, Yamantaka left the stage and entered the crowd. He lit a Molotov cocktail and attempted to throw it onto the stage so that he could fully burn the wreckage that he had just created and potentially burn down the entire building. Luckily, he was restrained, and at this stage, the show ended. The sheer danger and destruction of this gig is on a completely different level than any live show I have ever talked about on this channel. Hannah Tarash almost destroyed this entire building in the name of performance, and put everybody in the audience in severe danger. This wasn't something you simply mopped up and brushed away. This was a costly endeavor, and the duo paid the price. Specifically, 600,000 yen, the equivalent of $9,000. They also lost the privilege to play in Tokyo for 10 years, and when word began to spread about this insane show, they had a lot of difficulty performing anywhere in the country, as most venues were understandably cautious about booking Hannah Tarash. Considering the circumstances, it's not the most severe penalty for such an egregious performance, and it could have ended horribly. If somebody was seriously hurt or killed, the pair could have ended up behind bars, regardless of the waivers that the audience had signed. But amazingly, nobody was hurt and the duo became an infamous act in the underground scene. By all accounts, this was a historic show, and it gave the duo a new title, the world's most dangerous band. And to be honest, they probably earned it. The rest of the 80s were a difficult time for Hannah Tarash, but the 90s were easier when Yamantaka Ai vowed to tone down his insane performances. This led to various different clubs allowing the duo to perform at their venues again, and while some of these shows were a little bit chaotic, nothing would ever compare to the shows that they did in the mid-80s. They truly were a once-in-a-lifetime act, and it's actually difficult to speak about Hannah Tarash from a purely musical perspective, when their live shows are so intrinsically linked to the act as a whole. Japan's noise scene in the 80s and 90s were undoubtedly a genre-defining time, with acts like Merzbau, Hijo Kaiden, and Incapacitants all creating projects that changed the scene. Hannah Tarash were right up there, and even took it to a new level when it came to their live performances. I'll leave two videos linked down below that were created by Pad Chennington. I came across them while I was researching this video, and he does a much better job when it comes to speaking about Japanese noise music from a more academic standpoint. This video was more of a profile piece of Hannah Tarash's early work and their insane live shows, but I hope that doesn't deter you from learning more about the genre as a whole, because regardless of the absolute chaos, it is a fascinating world filled with fascinating musicians. But that's all from me today, I will see you in the next video. Although he was in a genre and era that was wrapped in controversy on a consistent basis, G.G. Allen was on a different level entirely. His antics, opinions, and music made him one of the most controversial and talked about figures in the punk scene during the 80s and early 90s. And today, over 25 years after his death, Allen is still talked about constantly in the world of music. Everything about his life, his upbringing, and his artistry was bizarre. He was described as a genius by some and a complete degenerate by others. Some people idolized him, some people hated him, but during his short time on this earth, nobody could take their eyes off of G.G. Allen. The earliest indication that Allen's upbringing was far from normal comes from his name. He was born Jesus Christ Allen on the 26th of August, 1956, in New Hampshire. That name alone should tell you that his parents were some strange individuals. Specifically his father, Merle Allen, who stated that Jesus had visited him and told him that his new son would be similar to the Messiah, thus giving him the name. This insane childhood would help form Gigi into the man he would soon become, and it is a pivotal part of the story. The best way to tell you about Alan's childhood and his erratic father is in his own words. He wrote a 1200-word essay titled, The First Ten Years, that details his strange upbringing and gives us insight into how hard his life was as a kid. The first five years of my life were infested with sickness and violence. It consisted of living in a log cabin in the northern woods of New Hampshire with father, mother, and brother. It was an extremely real, primitive, antisocial existence with no running water, little heat, and unbearably claustrophobic. We boiled water, 
laundered, and would bathe in a very tiny, chipped sink. I was immensely sick with asthma, always fighting to breathe amidst emotionally uncomfortable conditions with a cabin where the wall colors were that of the ever-peeling paint strips. We lived in darkness. Father hated life. He also didn't care much for the company of other people. The surrounding air was suffocated in destruction. We were more like prisoners than a family. We were prisoners to father, and father was a prisoner of himself. From this essay, you can tell that his father made his family's life hell, and his mother, Arletta Gunther, was getting increasingly worried that he was going to do something drastic to either Gigi or his older brother, who was also named Merle. This led to her taking her two sons and fleeing the log cabin while her husband was at work. Arletta would take them from a dire situation to a slightly less dire situation. Gigi claimed that she was attracted to a certain type of guy and that these men would often make their lives difficult, but it was at least better than the insane life they had before their father. Gigi's mother would have his name legally changed from Jesus to Kevin and had him and his brother enrolled in a high school in Vermont. During their time in high school in the 1960s, Gigi and his brother Merle would get up to all sorts of trouble that would foreshadow their chaotic music careers. Alan said in an interview that their childhood was very chaotic, full of chances and dangers. We sold drugs, stole, broke into houses, cars, did whatever we wanted to for the most part, including all the bands we played in. People even hated us back then. While this was happening, Alan was being inspired by bands like The Beatles, The New York Dolls, Alice Cooper, The Dave Clark Five, and The Ramones. Merle and Gigi will continue their illegal antics for the duration of the 60s and most of the 70s, but these influences would lead them to creating a number of short-lived bands that would create the blueprint for Gigi Allen's music and image. Gigi Allen's discography is a vast, poorly produced mess with a lot of great hidden gems filled with interesting songs and a lot of duds that are essentially non-starters. It would take hours to properly cover in detail the amount of music this man has made, but the first few bands he was a part of is an essential part of his history. In the mid-teens, Alan formed the band Little Sister's Date with his brother, and the band primarily covered rock songs at the time. This wouldn't last long, however, as the pair would gradually transition their interest into punk, and their music would reflect that. Little Sister's Date lasted around a year, and was one of his many short-lived projects. Other brief bands included Malpractice and Strip Search, and it's evidence that his chaotic behavior and nature was the driving force behind these bands falling apart. However, his work with the band The Jabbers was arguably the most important part of Alan becoming who he was. He was with them from 1977 to 1984, and in those six and a half years, Gigi Allen and The Jabbers would release some interesting music, especially the band's first album, titled Always Was, Is, and Always Shall Be. This album, released in 1980, was an 11-track project that was less than 30 minutes in length, but there were a lot of interesting notes to take from it. Alan's voice sounded much healthier than what we're used to, the songs were a lot slower, and there were elements of pop in some of the tracks. Of course, the lyrics were at times controversial and bizarre, but this was nothing in comparison to what he would go on to do in the world of music. In fact, this is one of the only times where it seems like Gigi was genuinely trying to appeal to some kind of a market or audience. In his later years, Alan would challenge and fight his audience in many different ways, whether it be by literally trying to fight them or challenging them with his controversial opinions or hard to swallow music. But this little Gigi, who was clearly very inspired by New York Dolls, seemed to actually care about how his music was received, how good it sounded, and how many people were listening. Unfortunately, despite some of the album's promising moments, it essentially came and went. This may have lit a bitter spark under Alan as his antics got progressively crazier from here, and by April of 1984, Gigi Allen and the Jabbers were no more. 
It was a surprisingly good run, and strangely, even though Alan would go on to garner a large fan base and a nationally known controversial image, this was the best his music would ever sound from a technical standpoint. The quality never increased after this, and some critics and fans would say that that was for the best, while others would say that it was an example of his squandered potential. Either way, Alan was on his way to some strange and bizarre times, and he was going to get there with or without the music. WCPX-TV Orlando. Michelle Morrow with tonight's news. Meteorologist Pamela Kister. And Mike Storms with sports. This is News Night 6. Looks pretty tame tonight, but what happened here last night would make most of us sick. Hello everyone, thanks for joining News Night 6. The club owner says it happens in big cities everywhere. Last night it happened in Orlando, something you would never expect to see in public. And in the end, two men arrested on charges almost beyond belief. News Night 6 reporter Shepard Smith joins us live outside the club Space Fish on Church Street with this exclusive report. Michelle, we must warn what you are about to see and hear is quite graphic, but it's true. Happened at the club Space Fish behind me last night. A band called G.G. Allen and the Murder Junkies, performing at a club that prides itself, in its words, on having shows on the cutting edge. People paid $7 to watch a man defecate into his own hand while he was nude. And that is just the beginning. The Jabbers may have disbanded, but Allen was more active in the music scene than ever before. His antics were becoming increasingly extreme, and his drug habits were becoming intense. These probably went hand in hand, and helped to create a strangely defining moment in his career. In 1985, at a show in Illinois, Allen took a number of laxatives, and during his performance, he defecated on stage. The crowd had dwindled from around 125 to 20 at this point. But that small audience were shocked and started running for the door as quickly as they could. The owners and security tried to stop him, but unsurprisingly, nobody wanted to go near the shit-covered psychopath who was now throwing his excrement around at every poor attendee he could reach. Alan and his bandmate fled the scene, but were later arrested. Surely, this was a once-off, based on the crowd reaction, the arrest, and the damaging impact on Gigi's career. But no, this was only the beginning. Gigi seemed to love this reaction, and if anything, he wanted more. This was the first time he did something like this, but he would go on to do it many more times all over the country. His antics got more extreme, his drug habits got more intense, and the character of Gigi Allen was in full effect. The world was about to be informally introduced to punk's most insane icon. After this show, Allen recorded some music with another band, the Texas Nazis. At this point, his music was more intense, counterculture, and sounded nothing like the music he made five years ago. It was a stark contrast and a great representation for where Gigi was in his bizarre career. In 1989, Gigi Allen was arrested for assault on a female friend of his and he was sent to prison where he stayed from December 25th, 1989 to March 16th, 1991. A lot happened in this period of time. For one, Gigi Allen and the Murder Junkies was formed, which would go on to be the most successful and discussed band Allen was ever a part of. He also wrote the Gigi Allen Manifesto while in prison, a mission statement of sorts that detailed Allen's opinions on the music world, the political climate in America, and the reasoning behind his non-conformist nature. In the manifesto, he writes, if you believe in the real underground of rock and roll, then now is the time to do something about it. The time is now to overthrow the current situations and declare war on the record companies, radio stations, publications, and anyone who promotes the whole so-called scene as it now stands. We need to destroy it all and take it back from the corporate phonies and conformists. But action must be taken now and blood must be spilled. It was obvious that Gigi had a clearer vision of what he wanted to achieve and how he wanted to achieve it. When he was eventually released from prison, he broke the terms of his parole almost immediately and went on tour with his newly formed band. It was around this time that a young and ambitious filmmaker showed interest in creating a documentary about Gigi. 
This filmmaker was Todd Phillips. He went on a tour with the band and filmed some of the most bizarre G.G. Allen moments ever caught on tape. It showed the depraved side of him and a slightly different side, an articulate, calmer, more sober Gigi who somewhat reflected on his actions and, at least in his own mind, justified his behavior. It was probably the best piece ever made about Alan, and it's not surprising that Todd Phillips will become as successful as he became. Ironically, his highest grossing movie was about another depraved lunatic who hated society, but I digress. At this stage, Gigi Allen was a notorious and arguably famous or infamous musician. He was selling out shows, creating headlines everywhere he went, and he ended up on various different talk shows to discuss his antics, such as Geraldo and The Jerry Springer Show. In 1993, Allen appeared on The Jane Whitney Show in a now famous interview. This would, unfortunately, be Gigi's final interview on television because in that same month, he would die. What's your ultimate idea of a, of a performance, of a fantasy performance? All of, it's not a fantasy performance, Jane. Come on, everything I do is real. It comes out of my head. Well, what's your I live this life every day. When I'm on stage, it's my therapy. It's not a performance, it's a ritual. And the ultimate performance would be when I have reached my peak, and I'm not there yet, so don't you all clap when I say this. I'll commit suicide, but I'll take your kids with me. When you reach your peak, it's time to die. And when do you think your peak's going to be? Whenever the battle is over, yeah. whenever you have lost the power to fight. When you have got the power to fight, you fight. When you lose the power, you kill yourself or I'll kill you. Are you a happy person? I'm beautiful. <laughs> Gigi always claimed that he was going to take his own life on stage, in an ultimate act of defiance and performance. But this did not happen. Maybe it could have happened if he lived a little bit longer, but on the 28th of June, 1993, Gigi Allen died after performing in Manhattan. The show was pretty normal by Gigi Allen's standards. He performed one song, and during the second track, the venue cut the power in an attempt to stop Allen from performing. He trashed the club, defecated on stage, and fought the audience members, until eventually going outside and walking aimlessly around the streets of Manhattan. A small number of his audience followed his reckless path as he tried and failed to get a cab a number of times and walked around for around an hour until eventually getting to his friend Johnny Puke's apartment. At the apartment, Gigi, his bandmates, and some of his fans partied for hours and during this time, Alan took a large amount of heroin and accidentally overdosed. Later, somebody called an ambulance, but it was too late. Gigi was pronounced dead at the scene he was 36 years old. It was over. Gigi's insane life had come to an end, but the party didn't stop there. At his funeral, the mortician was asked to leave Alan's corpse the way it was, decomposing and rotting, as his friends partied around his body, taking drugs, posing with the corpse, and blasting his music. Gigi was buried with a bottle of Jim Beam and headphones that played The Suicide Sessions, an album that Gigi Allen had made four years prior. It was a strange but morbidly fitting way for Gigi to go. Alan would only become more famous because of this, and although he wasn't as big as some of his contemporaries, his success was nothing short of a phenomenon. A drug addicted, somewhat confused, self-proclaimed degenerate had etched his way into the punk hall of fame, and he probably didn't even want to be there. His life may have ended, but his legacy would be discussed for decades in a comical but almost respectable fashion. Regardless of what you think, by the time he died, he had left his footprint on the music world. Well, I'm so impressed. The cover of the new record. Have you heard the cover of his new record? I know. It's yeah. him in a casket and the band standing around the casket like... <laughs> I swear to God. Gigi still sings. <laughs> Gigi lives. Did you ever see Gigi? Gigi did you see Gigi live? Gigi. No, I was just too afraid. It was an amazing experience. No, I, I just afraid. I could have went one time. I know he knew he was playing, but I just didn't get around to it. There is so much that I didn't get to talk about when it comes to this man. Like his insanely large discography of music that spanned two decades and consisted of over 30 albums and over a dozen bands. Like the fact that he had contact with Johnny Cash, or that celebrities and performers like Kurt Cobain, Hank Williams III, Lil Uzi Vert, 
Eric Andre, and hundreds of other entertainers would talk about him in both a positive and negative light. Or even the fact that he had a strange relationship with serial killer John Wayne Gacy, who he would write to and visit on a number of occasions. Gacy even admitted being a fan of Alan and painted the artwork for one of his albums. These facts and anecdotes are just footnotes in Alan's insane career and it goes to show how much he did in his short life. Given the circumstances he grew up in, the abuse he went through, and the lack of resources he had, it is impressive at what he managed to achieve. It doesn't justify his actions, but it helps to give an insight into such a strange and bizarre character. On the one hand, people viewed him as a violent, antagonistic degenerate with squandered potential who actively made poor decisions on a consistent basis. On the other hand, he was a passionate musician, a talented writer, and an articulate but misunderstood man. But you can boil it down whatever way you want. Love him, hate him, praise him, or scold him. The reality is, he probably wouldn't have cared either way. You know, when my time comes, and, and, and like I said, if you accelerate death, then you, if you seek death, you accelerate life, which is actually true, because you're living so fast and you're putting so much time, so much, so many years in such a little bit of time, that if I was to die tomorrow, I'd probably still live more years than, than most people do anyway, so that's the way I choose to do it. Like I said, you lay down the, 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 the road work, you sit down, you say whatever you gotta say, you make your purpose known, and then you leave. Chilino Sanchez was a musician who passed away three decades ago, and yet he is still talked about and listened to in the present day. This is mainly because of his music, which achieved immense popularity and standed the test of time. But it's also because of his insane life, his criminal activities, and his mysterious death in 1992. In the last ever concert he performed, Sanchez received a note while he was on stage that allegedly said if he continued to perform, he would be killed. He looked at the note, crumbled it up, and continued singing. A few hours later, he was killed after being shot in the head twice. A lot happened in his life before this. A lot of fans, enemies, and great music was made along the way, and he left us with a legacy that was truly one to behold. This is the story of Chalino Sanchez. Chilino Sanchez, whose full name was Rosalino Sanchez Felix, was born on the 30th of August 1960 in Las Flecas Ranch, which was around 20 miles east of Culiacan in the northwest of Mexico. His upbringing was a rough one. He was the youngest of seven children, and although his mother and father were hard-working people, they were still quite poor, and when Chilino was only six years of age, his father passed away, leaving his family in an even worse condition that was dire to say the least. It's hard to tell when exactly Chilino started committing crimes to make money, but his sister, Juana Sanchez, described him as mischievous from an early age and it's probable that his life of crime began sooner rather than later. Juana is also a pivotal part of the story for a different reason, because in the mid-70s, she was the victim of a terrible assault by a man named Chapo Perez. It's hard to find specific details about this crime or Chapo Perez himself, but from the little details I could scrape together, that's probably for the best. Either way, Perez was a dangerous man and a pretty terrible one, but given the power that he had in the area, he probably assumed that he got away with the heinous crime he committed scot-free, but his karma was right around the corner in the form of a vengeful younger brother. Even though Chilino was only 15 years old when this happened to his sister, he was ready to exact revenge. Around two years later, Chilino ran into Perez at a party, and the story goes that without saying a word, Chilino walked up to Perez, took out a gun, and shot him in the head. Some of those details might have been lost in translation or even exaggerated, but the result was the same. Perez was dead and Chilino had no more business in his hometown. It was time to go. He went to Tijuana, where he made his money helping people cross the border from Mexico to the United States, and a couple of years later, in 1977, he had the same idea. He crossed the border and went to Los Angeles to stay with his aunt in Inglewood. 
For the duration of his life, Cellino had a love for music and had always dreamed of being a successful musician, but it's fair to say that at this point of his life, that was merely a pipe dream and not something that was sustainable. For this reason, when he got to Los Angeles, he had to make his money elsewhere, and he did so by selling cars, doing dishes, and taking odd jobs that he would get every now and then. He would also continue his illegal antics by dabbling in drug dealing, and the business of helping people illegally cross the border also continued. This was done with his older brother, Armando, and it appeared that Cellino was simply doing whatever it took to make money, which took him in all sorts of very strange directions, and making music was not a part of his plans. However, that all changed in 1984, and unfortunately, it was inspired by a murder. Nineteen eighty four started off quite well for Cellino. He married his girlfriend at the time, who was already pregnant with his first child, and based on the odd jobs and illegal activities he was doing, he was probably making some good money, at least better than the financial strain his family had as a kid. However, with these kinds of activities, there was obviously a lot of danger involved, and it was in the same year that tragedy struck. Armando Sanchez, Cellino's older brother who worked closely with him, was shot and killed in a motel room in Tijuana. Cellino obviously took this quite hard, and he did something that might have been considered uncharacteristic at the time. He wrote a song, specifically a corrido, which is a type of storytelling ballad that usually contains more socially conscious songwriting. In this case, it served as a tribute for Armando, and it celebrated his life. While Cellino had no intention to release this in any other major capacity, he did share this around to various different friends and family, who were all quite impressed. At this stage, Cellino was in and out of prison because of his criminal activities, but he started to use his time effectively by writing songs for other inmates based on their stories. He continued this when he got out of jail by actually accepting different commissions from people who wanted to either pay tribute to their deceased loved ones or simply have their story told in a song of their own. While this may have seemed like a simple business hustle, Cellino was actively writing songs that had serious narratives and conscious songwriting. He was honing his craft and probably not even realizing it. At the same time, word was spreading, demand was getting higher, and it was clear that there was an audience for authentic Mexican music that told real stories, as opposed to some of the more watered-down, Americanized Mexican music that was on the radio at the time. Even if this meant singing about dealing drugs and violence, it was still an authentic narrative that people wanted to hear. Cholino's music caught the attention of Angel Para a sound engineer with his own studio in California who wanted to work with Cellino. Together they created a 15-track demo in 1989 and would sell these cassettes from the boot of his car. Cellino was a prolific recorder and quickly began to create music at a rapid pace while independently distributing his work and it was an effective strategy. By 1992, he had amassed a small but loyal fan base. however this fan base was about to swell and it's not for the reason you would expect. By 1991, Cholino was performing small but lively shows around California, and it seemed like he was beginning to make a name for himself. His promising music career might have meant that he was going to distance himself from the life of crime he had once known, and that may have been the case, but in the beginning of 1992, something happened that the media would latch onto, and the public perception around Cholino was about to change for better or for worse. It was the 25th of January and Sanchez was performing in the city of Coachella in California at Las Arcos nightclub to around 400 people. The night was going as planned and it seemed like it would be a perfectly normal show until a man named Eduardo Gallegos. He was clearly under the influence and this may have been the reason that he took out a 25 caliber pistol and started to shoot at Cholino. Sanchez responded by pulling out a pistol of his own and began shooting back at Gallegos who fled into the crowd. This created an insane shootout between the pair. Gallegos was now shooting from the crowd and Cellino was essentially shooting at the crowd in an attempt to defend himself. At this stage, he was already shot and probably just shooting in the hopes that he would hit his attacker. Between the confusion, the chaos, and the fact that Gallegos was already under the influence to begin with, we had a very chaotic shootout on our hands where bullets were flying everywhere and anybody could have been hit at any time. Eventually, 
a bystander, wrestled Galigos to the ground and shot him in the mouth with his own pistol. He actually survived this, but unfortunately, around 10 people were hit in this exchange, and 20-year-old Claudio Lean Carazana was shot in the leg, and eventually bled out while his friends rushed him to the hospital. It was an insane situation and it bred a lot of media coverage because of its sensationalist nature. The LA Times, LA Weekly, AP News, Deseret, ABC, and countless other publications reported on this story, and surprisingly, this was what gave Chilino Sanchez airplay on the radio. Specifically his song Nieves de Enero, which fittingly translates to Snows of January. Cholino was in critical condition because of this shooting, but he made it out of the hospital and was able to resume his work after this. Although he was now a very popular name, it's speculated that Cholino had a hard time coming to terms with the way that he found his success. It was pretty obvious to many that he was going to find this success one way or another. He was releasing music that was loved, and his audience resonated with his work. But he had been catapulted into this strange stardom because of a night that he probably wanted to forget. It's hard to tell because the reports are so secondary and don't hold that much weight to them. But Cholino not liking this newfound fame would make sense given the circumstances. Either way, he was a bigger deal than ever before, and his next show in LA was packed to the brim. It was a bigger venue, and although he was going to be performing at 10pm that night, the doors had to be closed at 6 because it had sold out that quickly. It's clear that Cholino was a bona fide star, and it had its perks. For example, he signed to Muzart, which was Mexico's biggest publishing company, and the deal gave Cholino around $100,000, but unfortunately, it also gave the publishing company all of the rights to all of Cholino's music, which would ultimately be worth millions. But at the time, it seemed like things were working in Cholino's favor, and he was on his way to a lot of success. Of course, we know that this ultimately did happen. Cholino would not be there to see how incredibly successful he would become, because soon after the Coachella incident, he was killed under extremely mysterious circumstances. Four months after the shooting in Coachella, Cholino was in high demand and he decided to return to the place he came from by performing a rare gig in Culiacan on the 15th of May 1992. All things considered, the show was relatively normal, although the fact that it was actually in Mexico as opposed to the States added a new dynamic to the event. Cholino had most likely made quite a few enemies given his history and was also probably the subject to a lot of envy because of his newfound success. It may have been because of this that there was a target on Cholino's head at the show. It's difficult to find a timeline that accurately reflects the events of this night, but what is known is that during the gig, Cholino Sanchez received a note that read something along the lines of, If you continue this show, you will die. We'll never know what the note actually said because Cholino crumpled up the piece of paper and essentially ignored it. Armed men with alleged state police identification cards pulled over Cholino and convinced him that the head of police wanted to see him. He was detained and put into one of their vehicles. The timeline becomes a bit blurred at this stage, but at some point after Cholino was detained, he was blindfolded and shot in the head twice. A few hours later, he was found and pronounced dead at the scene. Nobody was ever arrested and no motive was even established by the police, but it's probable that it was related to the Mexican drug trade that Cholino Cholino played a part in. Regardless of the motive, the outcome was the same. Cholino was no longer with us. He was only 31 years of age. He had popularized the art of making corridos for those around him, and based on the insane life that he had lived, there was probably nobody more deserving of this exact treatment than Cholino himself. Cholino Sanchez is by far the most popular artist I've covered. Three decades after his passing, he still has millions of monthly listeners on various different streaming platforms, millions upon millions of views on YouTube, and a very dedicated and loyal fan base that listens to and celebrates his music on a daily basis. He is an immensely popular man, and it's a huge pity that he died at such an early age, and that he died under such intense and mysterious circumstances. He made music dedicated to people that weren't usually sung about, and he wrote lyrics about a life that most people couldn't even comprehend before Cholino came along. His legacy is a confusing one, but to many people, Cholino Sanchez is one of the greatest artists in Mexican history.
1961, Polish composer Krzysztof Penderecki composed a piece of music that became internationally renowned for being both beautiful and terrifying. It consisted of 52 different stringed instruments and originally, when he wrote it, the piece came out to 8 minutes and 37 seconds in length. This was the original title of the composition, however after he heard the full completed piece live, he decided to dedicate it to the victims of the atomic bombing in the city of Hiroshima, thus changing the official name to Threnody to the Victims of Hiroshima. A fitting title considering that this piece plays like the soundtrack to a tragedy. Listeners have understandably stated that this song evokes feelings of fear, loneliness, and dread. Although this is considered to be the first time he was given widespread acclaim, Kristoff was no stranger to creating dark, experimental compositions. Born in 1933 in the southeast of Poland, Kristoff was a child when the Second World War began. He often describes his music as a reaction to the things that he saw growing up. A number of his family members were killed during this time, and being raised in a war-torn part of Europe that had tight censorship laws meant that Kristoff couldn't properly express himself through music. This is until the mid-1950s when those same laws were abolished and Poland saw an influx in the creative world. Musically, Kristoff was at the forefront of this. In 1958, he began teaching at the Academy of Music in the city of Krakow, and he continued to create his compositions. A year after his threnody to Hiroshima brought him major acclaim, he created the composition known as Fluorescences. And a year after that, he began working on a major composition known as Saint Luke Passion, which was originally performed in 1966. If you listen to these three pieces, you'll begin to notice some trends. For one, dark undertones exist in every one of them. In some cases, the entire piece is an eerie and haunting composition, and in other cases it's merely an aspect of a much larger puzzle, but those dark undertones are always there. The other trend in these pieces is his experimentation. He did things that were rarely seen at the time, adding instruments that seemed completely out of place, scoring his music in a slightly wild and messy way, and breaking a lot of the norms that were seen around that time. All I'm interested in is liberating sound beyond all tradition. A quote that he would stay true to in later years by continuing with this experimental nature, but in different ways. From the snippets that I've shown you, you may notice that some of these compositions sound familiar, and that's because excerpts of Kristoff's work have been used in multiple different classic horror movies, such as The Exorcist and The Shining. Maybe it was about him. I think we should discuss Danny. I think we should discuss what should be done. You can easily see how these compositions fit in very well with the score of a film like this, and these movies obviously have a major impact in the world of horror and cinema in general. In the 2000s, other well-known directors like Martin Scorsese and David Lynch would follow suit by also using Penderecki's music in their movies. He became known as horror's favorite composer, and based on the impact that these movies and directors had, it's fair to say that Kristoff essentially changed the way that these movies were scored at least in American cinema. Interestingly, he never directly worked on any of these movies that I mentioned. He simply gave them the permission to use the music or to make their own versions of his compositions. Instead of working on these movies, he instead opted to help score experimental films, animations, and documentaries, but from afar, he was quietly influencing thousands of other scores across the world. These dark, intense tones would bleed into the world of horror, and although the scores from classic horror movies are already quite creepy and ominous, Penderexi's influence helped take this to a new level, a different type of sinister, one that would draw in and terrify audiences for years. Kristoff's work was not met without controversy. He's spoken in past interviews about issues he's had with the church and the state regarding the nature of his work. Yes, the censorship laws had been loosened, but it was still the 50s and 60s when he got his foot in the door, and making music that had undertones as dark as this definitely got him in some hot water a number of times. I wanted to write a piece which is uh, telling the truth. 
And of course this piece was also very much criticized by the church uh, in Germany. The same happened in, in Poland, of course, after the, the premiere. And it was in the same time, there was a premiere in Rome. So the Vatican wanted me to stop the performance. I didn't do it. So I, I started to have a problem with the church, of course. Still, that didn't stop him from composing what he wanted. He continued to make this music throughout his life, making more hauntingly beautiful work. He became a professor at Yale University in the 1970s, and around this time, his style started to change. In so many words, he believed that as the avant-garde experimental world got more and more popular and universal, the creative liberties it once made were fading away, and instead he believed that by adopting a more traditional style, he could escape that world and find a new type of creative liberty. This style was seen in one of his best-known works, which he created in the 80s, Polish Requiem. Originally, he was commissioned to make a single piece of music that was dedicated to the victims of the 1970 Polish protests, and after creating it, he decided to turn it into a full tribute. So in a sense, it was similar to the threnody that he had created for Hiroshima, but it was a more all-encompassing tribute for the people of his country. His work continued throughout the 90s and the 2000s, and he's very much so stayed in the public eye up until very recently. So much so that he actually won his third Grammy in 2017, around six decades after he began his career. Christoph is also a major influence to many accomplished musicians, one of the most notable ones being Johnny Greenwood of Radiohead. The pair actually collaborated together and unsurprisingly, Greenwood has also scored a plethora of movies and these scores also take some major influence from Christoph. Unfortunately, Christoph passed away in March of 2020. From the moment he started, he created thought-provoking music that stayed relevant and consistent for decades. He also challenged norms, made unconventional art, and inspired countless others to do the same. He was thoroughly successful in his mission to achieve the creative liberty that he desired so badly, and as his music continues to inspire, he will continue to achieve that long after his death.